Welcome to the Full Story series, where we take some of our older videos in which we took trade paperbacks and single issues and we broke them down into digestible bites, giving you a fun motion comic experience with voices and music. We take a bunch of those older videos, combine them into a giant one, giving you like an hour long or more epic. Today we're gonna to be covering our entire collection of the Detective Comics run. This is a run that I am personally a fan of that came out during the original DC Rebirth uh, revival of Detective Comics with James Tinian IV writing the series. It was about Batman trying to build up a different team with Batwoman on it, Tim Drake, Clayface, Orphan, Spoiler, and those are the ones I remember off the top of my head. Oh, Azrael is also on this team. And it's what they did and the trials and tribulations that they had to go through as a team. And how do you deal with Batman of all people? It's a really cool story with a really epic finale. So I hope you guys enjoy this Batman epic. Two days ago, Azrael was being chased around Gotham City by what appeared to be Batman. He tried to fight against him. He tried his hardest to show that you don't mess with Azrael, but he failed. The window crashed open as Batman himself arrived, and he quickly saw a drone watching him, and then he asked Azrael, Who did this? And with a terrified look in his eyes, he told Batman, You did. Today, Batwoman is running across Gotham talking to her father on her communication device. Batwoman is an ex-soldier who took up the life of Batwoman when she decided that she could be more effective as a superhero than a soldier. Her father, though, is still within the military and on active duty within Gotham City. He helped train his daughter to become Batwoman, but he doesn't seem to agree with her mission anymore. He feels as though perhaps she should have stayed within the military, and she doesn't exactly agree as they end their conversation. Once she enters her house, she takes off her costume, and she finds Batman hiding out in there. He holds up a bat-shaped device and he asks for her help in solving a mystery. John Paul Valley was attacked and watched by this drone. The technology for this drone is at least 10 years beyond the highest grade military technology that we have. To make matters more confusing, Batman was able to hack into it long enough to find out that it was a part of a swarm of drones and they were watching multiple people. Batwoman asks him, why are you telling me this? And Batman explains, I want to take everyone in and retrain them. And I want your help in training the Bat family to ensure they are able to go at this alone. So she asks him, why are you asking me? And he tells her, because we are family. And he removes the cowl. Bruce's mother was Martha Kane, and Batwoman's name is Kate Kane. Kate is his cousin, but Kate just smiles. Damn it, Bruce, I've been waiting for you to admit that. How? He asks, but Kate just tells him, don't start underestimating her now. He then explains who the recruits are. Spoiler, AKA Stephanie Brown, the daughter of the Clue Master who put on the costume when Clue Master was trying to take down the city. Red Robin, aka Tim Drake, is a brilliant tactical mind and will make a good lieutenant for the operation. Cassandra Kane is an engineered assassin now going by the name Orphan. And Clayface, someone who needs a redemption and him not being watched makes him an asset. Batwoman agrees to help out, but she isn't about to play his game. Batman needs to explain to her everything that is going on and not hold anything back. Batman doesn't even know who he's up against. And as the drones watch his little team, the man in charge of it then asks, Can your unit face off against an army, Batman? The training begins quickly and fiercely with holographic situations presenting themselves such as a city overrun by jokers. But it's sloppy and not perfect and they aren't working together. They're used to fighting by themselves and Clayface isn't even used to being a hero. Plus, they keep restricting his power so that he can learn how to actually fight. Red Robin actually made a device that would allow him to retain his form and limit him to that form. So, with everyone arguing and going off to fight on their own, he asks if he can take it and try to live a normal life. Red Robin tells him sure and then he goes to talk to Batman man to figure out what is going on. Why is this team off of the table while he investigates everything? What is he keeping them away from? Batman brings Tim to Azrael's base of operations to show him the badly beaten man, and his doctor, Leslie Tompkins, sees Tim and tells Batman that it's good news that after Azrael was nearly beaten to death, you got teenagers involved. Batman ignores the comment and tells her that he needs to speak with Azrael, but he can only get out a few words. The colony is here. Batman and Tim go to the rooftop where Tim asks him, what is the colony, Bruce? And Batman tells him, I'm not sure. So why did you even bring me into this then? What's with the new costume and the new mission? I was doing fine on my own. Tim, regardless of you calling yourself Red Robin and keeping yourself at a distance, I've always considered you a Robin. I want you to know that Gotham is safer with you in it and you don't have to keep away. Tim thanks him. And then Bruce asks, is there anything else? No, Bruce, but there was, and he was supposed to tell him. Tim went back to Stephanie's apartment where Stephanie and Tim are all staying, as Stephanie asked him if he told Batman. You see, Tim was accepted to Ivy University on a full grant, the Genius Grant. And he's been debating leaving the superhero life and getting his degree because he feels that he could be more helpful to the world in that fashion. And Stephanie agrees. 
and wants to support him. Because ever since they started to get to know each other, they started dating. Meanwhile, Kate went to see her father as he was putting on a suit and he asked her, how was Batman's boot camp? She snapped at him asking if he was listening in on her communications and he told her you shouldn't have accepted his offer. After an argument about where she puts her loyalties, Kate leaves the house telling him that she isn't even sure why she came. Everything is moving along fine until Batman is driving through the streets discussing with Alfred the possibility of a military connection when behind him he realizes that he isn't alone. He calls out for the brakes to be hit and then large vehicles speed past him. He then takes off down a side street and an EMP blast goes off shutting down the supposedly shielded Batmobile and it drives into a wall. He leaps out of the Batmobile and he turns around to see dozens of men in Bat-esque looking suits. One of them then speaks up. There are 50 of us here. We have orders to take you in. Batman jumps on them. You can try! Batman gets beaten down badly while Batwoman and Tim are watching the recordings back at the base. They know that Batman has been captured. So Batwoman turns to Tim. Batman wouldn't want help. He would try to handle this privately. And if he did want help, he would only want the two of us to go do it. What do you think? Tim asks her. I think I gotta make some calls, she says smiling. The call goes out to the team and they all head off. And Colonel Kane, her father, also gets a call asking for help. And he's happy about that. The team all arrives at the base where Batwoman shows Batman getting beat down on the screen. And she explains that Batman didn't tell everyone something. Whoever this is was able to put together a team with the power enough to capture Batman. I'm here to tell you that they're all watching you and that is why Batman put this together. So I brought in an expert to help with military operations. Then she introduces her father, Colonel Kane. He walks forward asking the important question, why would a military organization model themselves after Batman? Tim tells him, because he built a model worth replicating. That's what I was thinking too, Colonel Kane tells him. You have to assume they have a reason to stay hidden from him. Perhaps he is the inspiration, but they know that he wouldn't agree with their tactics. And they must be after something here at Gotham to remove him from the board. The question then comes up, where is Orphan? Because she's currently being rounded up by the same unit and battling them on the rooftop. But not just any rooftop, the roof of this base. Tim is in shock. They're here? Then Colonel Kane tells him, I have this. And he loads up a flash drive that shuts off the defensive perimeter. Batwoman's eyes go wide. Dad, what are you doing? And he tells her, my duty. And the ceiling is broken and troops jump in. Everyone begins to get close together and then another troop comes through the window with Orphan riding him down to the ground. Every soldier then shoots her with tranks until she falls. And the colonel then explains, years ago you came to me for help in becoming something like the Batman. What you didn't know is that I had my own mission here in Gotham to shape a force that would mimic the Batman. The idea of Batman is a powerful one, but it was pointed in the wrong direction. This is the Batman of the future, a unit built to fight things on a larger scale than crime in Gotham. He then steps forward and he places his hand on Kate's shoulder. Join us. You called me here today because you needed my help, so join our cause. During this whole talk though, Red Robin was patching into the system to activate something, an escape protocol that is now activated. Clayface wraps the team up in a mud ball and as it's closing, Batwoman says the words, I trusted you dad, and the team drops through the floor. Meanwhile, Batman wakes up bound. He dislodges the tooth and he spits it on the ground and the room fills with gas. He then stands before one of the men. Where am I? The man stammers. We, we just called the cave. He turns around to see where he is and it's a recreation of a bat cave with a complete military training unit, weapons and vehicles. Meanwhile, Tim leads everyone into his own secret base of operations beneath their other secret base of operations where he patched into an old train tunnel system and created carts that could get them anywhere in Gotham within minutes. Back with Batman, he walks through the cave until he finds a computer system and he sees a global map. These Batman sleeper cells are all over the globe. A kid walks into the room and Batman throws him down to the ground demanding to know everything that there is to know about the colony. And the kid wearing a Batman shirt tells him, okay, we're all fans of you here. He explains that he is the computer genius behind the colony's tech. And as he gets a selfie with Batman, he explains that his name is Ulysses. Zero Year changed everything. One man on his own accomplished what an entire military unit could not. Imagine if they dropped a Batman in the middle of a terrorist stronghold, or a dozen Batmen. He then shows Batman footage of the Batmen in action, kicking in doors and shooting up the enemies. He explains that everyone here is huge fans of him, and it's time to take this show to the next level. So Batman breaks his arm. You're coming with me. I don't think so, Batman. And then the Batman throw him out of the office and into the hallways where more Batmen are waiting on him, and Colonel Kane walks walks over. Hello, Bruce. Don't worry, their headsets have static so they can't hear us. Uncle Jake. When did you figure out it was me? When did you decide to take my daughter from me? When I noticed you had more drones following her than any of us combined. How about you join us? I don't work for anyone. Figured. That's why I was preparing my daughter. You don't understand, Batman. The League of Shadows is here in Gotham. The League of Shadows is a myth created to frighten Ra's al Ghul's followers. You're a fool, Batman. They are hiding their moves in the actions of others, and you brought my daughter into this to die by your side? Colonel Kane then puts a gun to Batman's head. They'll all come to my side when they see the real war. 
but that's when Kate is standing near them, surprising everyone as to how she got here. And she asks him, you want me to pick a side? How's this for an answer? And the whole team charges in. The battle rages on with the entire Bat Team versus an entire army of Bat Men. Kate explains that they had transportation, and right now they are 30 miles outside of Gotham, so it's time to carve a path to the exit. And Clayface grows in size, and he creates two blades. I can do some carving. Everyone is dropping their own groups of Bat Men and winning their battle, so Tim goes upstairs to meet the genius behind it all, Ulysses. Tim wraps him up and looks at the computer, realizing that there are targets all over Gotham, and the Bat Men army is going to eradicate any potential League of Shadows member. The military would never sign off on this many targets at once, and Ulysses tells him, hey, what they don't know won't hurt them. More soldiers then arrive, and they begin dropping their belts of grenades, claiming that they just went off. The explosions blow up everywhere, and everyone ducks for cover, and Tim begins to ask, what happened? Only to see spoiler there telling him, they really shouldn't let those grenades go off remotely. Everyone keeps battling until they realize that they need to get out of this base and save all of the people who are targeted, so Clayface makes a bridge leading to the surface, and they all make a break for it. Once they get to the top floor, they find that orphans already Already dropped everyone there, and she's smiling about it. Colonel Kane hovers up on a hovercraft telling them to stop, and Batman drops a smoke pellet, and the whole crew vanishes. Ulysses turns to Colonel Kane. You know what they're gonna do, right? Yes, they're going to alert the proper officials to what we're doing, and they're going to get us shut down. I could send all of my drones off to kill our targets, sir, but we weren't able to trim that list down and figure out who's really in the league. I think the term is acceptable loss, sir. Do it. Batman and the crew get back, and they think that they've won. They celebrate. Steph and Tim go over when is he going to tell Batman that he's officially leaving this life because he's come to his decision. He's going to go to college. Meanwhile, Batman goes to see Kate and tell her that he's sorry, but she knows what they have to do. Yes, her father was there for her, but it's time to end this. So Batman calls out the president himself to inform him of a secret covert operations branch of this military. Tim sits down to have a look at the data from the cave's computers, and he sees something horrifying. The drones are moving on their targets. He calls the whole team back to the base to inform them that this isn't over yet. He tells everyone that it looks like the unit has decided a few hundred innocents are a problem if they hit their targets, and Batman tells them they are all innocent. No one dies tonight. They all run through the city telling and warning everyone to get away from the sites. League of Shadows or not, no one dies. Even that individual with blacked out eyes. But they realize that they can't save everyone. It's an impossible task to cover so many targets. So Red Robin comes up with a plan of his own. He'll hack the drones and retarget them to one target. One person ending their mission when he dies or he beats the drones. Colonel Kane and Ulysses begin to freak out when they see what Red Robin has done. And regardless of what Ulysses tries, he can't change the target. The encryption is incredible. Because tonight, all of those drones are going to murder Tim Drake. Spoiler calls up Batman shouting at him. Tim just programmed all of the drones to attack himself. And Batman's eyes go wide. Meanwhile, on the roof of the Wayne Tower, Tim walks to the edge of it. And he looks at all of the shiny lights coming for him. As they get closer, he tells them, let's dance. Back at the base of Batman, Argus arrives informing Colonel Kane that he's under arrest by the command of the Commander-in-Chief. And Ulysses informs Colonel Kane that Red Robin is actually winning. He's taking out each and every one of those drones. The Batman have moved their floating airship in an attempt to escape, but Kate won't let her father get away as she arrives on it and jumps out of it, holding him, bringing him down to a rooftop. You shouldn't have done that, Kate. And she sucker punches him before calling up Batman and telling him that she has Colonel Kane in custody. But she warns Batman, this is about to get worse. There's a second wave of drones. Batman tells her that he called up Nightwing to try and get Midnighter's help with the door teleportation technology, but it might be too late. Meanwhile, back with Tim. He lays on the roof out of breath, and Batman calls him up. Tim, get off of that tower. Just need to catch my breath. Are the people, are the people safe? They will be. Good. Hate to think I broke all these ribs for nothing. I think I got shot in my leg. The shock's wearing off. Tim, what's that? I think I hear. Tim looks up and he sees the second wave and he sees double the amount of drones coming at him again. He knows what this means. Through his heavy breathing, he calls up Batman again. Bruce, don't say it. Tell them I'm sorry. Tell them how much they all meant to me. Dick, Jason, Damien, Alfred, all of them. Thank you for everything, Bruce. Robin out. Tim! He then calls up Stephanie. Steph, can you hear me? I'm almost there, Tim, I'm almost. Listen, Steph, these last few months have been incredible. You've helped me discover what I wanted to do with my life, the kind of man that I could be. I wish I could be there for you. Steph hits top speed on her motorcycle and she begins to race through the streets, hoping beyond hope that she can make it. Tim, don't hang up, stay with me. I love you, Steph. Goodbye. He then stands up, bracing himself with his staff, and he looks at the drones. And then, he's riddled with missiles and bullets. They report that the target is eliminated, and the mission is over and everyone heard it on their comms. The world has lost another Robin. 
Batman falls to his knees, grasping Tim's staff with his blood all over it as there were so many explosions that it appears to be the only thing left. And as Batwoman lands, he demands to know where Colonel Kane is. Later that night, Stephanie returned home to see Batman there waiting for her. With a sad look in her eyes, he asks if she's okay. He wanted to make sure. He wanted her to know that Tim died saving hundreds of lives. He put the world before himself. The greatest heroes always do, and he'll be remembered for that. He chose this life, Stephanie. We all did. We all knew what the cost may be. She walked over to a table, and she grabbed a letter. You don't understand. And she handed him that letter. As Batman began to read Tim's acceptance letter to college, his hands began to tremble, and he dropped it to the ground, realizing that Tim intended to leave this life. He then held Stephanie as she poured her eyes out. Elsewhere, in a pitch black room, a crack of lightning goes off and Tim Drake finds himself on his knees, prepared to die. And then he looks up. Hello? This isn't the colony. Where am I? A man in a hood, holding a staff, walks in. The same man who orchestrated the doomsday incident for Superman. Mr. Oz. The man behind everything. Mr. Drake, what a pleasure it is to have you join us. I don't understand. I remember the missiles hitting me. Am I dead? To those that loved you. Yes, you are. Tell me where I am! You were connecting threads that could not be connected. You're so loved, so deeply intertwined that it became crucial that we take you off the field. That's where you are. Off the field. Mr. Oz then begins to walk out of the room as Tim shouts, MY FRIENDS WILL COME! Batwoman Kate Kane stands with Renee Montoya at the entrance of Wayne Enterprises looking up at the words no more painted across the sign. Kate asks what the hell happened here and Renee tells her that that is the question, isn't it? Renee begins to go over the report stating that Lucius Fox entered the lobby at 8.17. As he made his way towards the elevators, the doors opened up and a group of individuals stepped out. One of the men stepped forward and the entire room went silent. What happened next was something that Lucius can only describe as the officers were all dying from what seemed to be a hundred different poisons all at once. But at the end of it all, the man leading the group walked over to the counter and said that he would like to file an official complaint. As Kate begins to examine the scene, Renee also adds that nothing was stolen. The only people that got hurt were those cops, so it seems to be a bit extreme to just deliver a message. Kate stands up and asks, why did you call her and not him? Referring to her being Batwoman and not calling Batman. Renee says the symbol is in her color, so it seems like it was more directed towards her. Or maybe she ended their conversation the other night too quick and she's been regretting it. Kate turns away stating that she's going to need to get this information to Batman, but they will get to the bottom of this. Renee stops Kate telling her that something happened, didn't it? You're not usually this cold, so can you at least tell me what's wrong? Without looking back, Kate tells her that no, she can't. Because what's going on is the Bat family is still dealing with the loss of Tim Drake. A little while later, Kate reports back to Bruce with her findings of the Wayne building. But as they are now inside of the base, Bruce asks where is everyone at? Kate says that Orphan and Clayface are in the mudroom training. She called Spoiler for backup, but Spoiler didn't respond. Bruce says that Stephanie just needs time. But Kate tells him that she's been distracted, and she's not sure she can be a soldier after what she's lost. What they've all lost. Bruce turns back to the computer asking, Did you really need to remind me of that? Do you really think I'll ever forget? Meanwhile, over at Tompkins Free Clinic, Spoiler, aka Stephanie, talks with Harper Rowe about how if it wasn't for them, most of the people here wouldn't even be in this clinic. So, are they really doing anything good? These are the victims of the acts of Batman. Harper tells her that there would probably be a lot more people here if not for the Bat family. But if she's looking for something to justify why she's wearing that costume, Harper Rowe really isn't the best choice to give her an answer. Her Bluebird costume is locked away in her closet. Plus, with that, she is also less likely to end up in one of these beds. Stephanie begins to cry and Harper hugs her, telling her that she didn't mean it like that. And after a while, Jean-Paul walks over asking Harper if her friend is there to help pass out food. Stephanie says she's sorry, but she can't. And Harper says that after she walks her out, she'll help. Stephanie then sees something out the window as lightning strikes. She stops and Harper asks if there's anything wrong. And Stephanie says it's nothing. A short while later, Bruce and Kate pull up to the policeman's ball. But before getting out of the limo, Kate mentions that she's a little worried about the team. They all need help. Everyone on the team has experienced a real traumatic loss. And Stephanie isn't even responding to the calls anymore. Her suggestion is that they need someone to talk to to receive psychiatric help. As the two get out of the limo, Kate also mentions that with all of the tech in the Belfry half finished, they'll need to recruit someone capable of operating and maintaining the base. Tim Drake's the one who did that. 
Bruce says that he agrees, and that's the only reason that they're here tonight. All of the cameras and reporters flock over to a car floating to the ground, all calling out for Luke Fox. As Luke steps out of his car, Kate tells Bruce that he's gotta be joking. Everyone heads back inside, and Bruce tells Luke that they need to talk. Luke asks if they need to talk to him or the shiny suit, and Bruce tells him both. But before they can, Kate pulls Bruce aside and tells him that this guy may be smart, but he was a celebrity before he became a superhero. What has he really faced that would have her trust him? Bruce tries to tell her that Batwing has done some great work, and then an explosion goes off. From the rubble, the group of people who attacked Wayne Enterprises steps out, and the man leading them says, he has a message for Batman. He destroyed all of their lives. They are the Victim Syndicate, and they are here to return the favor. Crowds of people begin running, and Batman tells Kate and Luke that they need to suit up. Across the room, Renee runs in with her guns drawn, telling the man in red that he needs to put his hands into the air before somebody gets hurt. The man tells her not to worry. I'm not here for you. Not today, at least. The sound of smoke grenades begin to go off, and the man says, There he is! Don't be shy! Batman! We've only come to talk! As Kate, Stephanie, and Cass all get back into position, one of the women in the group mentions that they are all here as he suspected. The man in red then calls out to Batman, asking for him to come and say, Hello! From the smoke, Batman walks out and says, hello, and he punches him. However, the punch is stopped by a force field, and the man says that he has spent years making a suit designed to finally keep him safe, but he had better tell everyone else to pull back. Batman gives the order and then asks, who are you? The man says, you don't recognize us? And here I thought you would run out of ways to hurt us. Behind the group, Kate tells the others to prepare trank batterings on her mark. But as the man in red overhears this, he tells Mr. Noxus to take the blonde. Mr. Noxus smiles and Stephanie falls to her knees, vomiting with poison. Bruce runs over and the man in red says, not to worry. The poison inside of her is painful, but it won't kill her. So consider that a warning shot. Bruce tells everyone to stand down and the man in red makes sure that there are cameras on him. Bruce tells him, they're not a part of this. If you want to talk, you can talk too. But the words coming from Bruce suddenly go silent, and the man in red says, You cannot talk over us. The mute here has seen to that. And right now, we want you to listen, because you are the one who did this to us. The man in red then turns to the cameras, and he makes an announcement. To all of the innocent people of Gotham, we know your fears. Every night, the self-appointed saviors fight costume maniacs and literal monsters. And every night, we are the ones to pay the price. Many of your homes are destroyed in the crowd. Crossfire. None of us are unscathed. All of us are scarred. But right now we stand in a room with the officers who have not only allowed the vigilantes to rule the city, but they have assisted them. So if nobody will fight for us, the civilians of Gotham, we will fight for ourselves. So from now on, every day that Batman does not unmask and pledge to never act as Batman again, we will strike the people who support him. We are the Victim Syndicate, and we will take back our city. The man then turns back to Bruce and he asks him, So what do you say? I will even allow you to talk. Bruce tells him, I had Batwing cut the feed to that broadcast before it even went out, and he found the exact frequency to your bioelectric shield. And then he charges forward, punching him. Just then, the fighting breaks out as Cass jumps in, kicking Mr. Noxus, and Kate kicks the mute before he can silence Cass. Outside, Clayface and Harper help Stephanie out, and then a deformed woman calls out, Basil. Clayface tells Harper to go on ahead, and the woman tells Clayface, I want to see the real you. Show me the real monster that destroyed my life. Clayface begins to change, and he calls out to the woman, stating, Glory. She stops him, stating, That's not my name anymore. You can call me Mudface now. Back inside, Bruce grabs the man in red and he asks, Who are you? And he says, I was the first innocent whose life was ruined. The first victim of hundreds. But before Bruce could do anything, the other woman in the room jumps on Bruce's back, injecting him with toxin. She tells him that it's a paralytic. And then Luke blasts her away, shouting for her to get away. Through his struggled speech, Bruce mutters, I can't move. And Luke says, I got this. Luke then tells everyone that it's over. They're now surrounded, but the man in red walks over to Bruce, telling him, Everything that happens next is on you. Soon the the room begins to fill with green smoke and the woman says that it is an anti-fear toxin. She holds her gun up and she asks, what will happen if I fire this gun? But before anyone can do anything, the gun goes off. Later in the Belfry, Kate mentions that Cass is with Harper who took Stephanie over to Tompkins Free Clinic. They'll have guards up to keep watch. As Luke looks around, he says that this is a pretty fancy place, but right now they really need to chat. He then presses a button, having a round table appear before them, and everyone takes a seat. Kate begins going over all of the people that they came across at the ball. First, there's the Mute, also known as Virgil Myers. He used to own a joke store when he had an allergic reaction to one of Joker's laughing gases, which led to an extreme tracheotomy in order for him to survive. Next is Madame Crow, or Abigail O'Shea. She was a student of Dr. Jonathan Crane and used to be his first guinea pig in his experiments. 
Then there's Mr. Noxus, Guy Mandrake. He was a stockbroker who was briefly under Pamela Isley's control. The experience has changed his physiology to make him toxic to anyone around him. There's also Mudface, a woman named Gloria Griffin, who was a production assistant on Basil Carlo's last film. When he changed into Clayface, she was affected by the chemicals that changed him. Bruce slowly begins to remember these people, and then he tells Luke to go ahead and familiarize himself with Red Robin's systems. Batwoman will be in the streets and he'll go check on Spoiler. Back over at Stephanie's room in the clinic, she sees the man in red again, and he tells her, It's time we had a little chat! Later in Stephanie's room, Bruce tells Stephanie that he can't stress it enough. He needs for her to tell them what the first victim told her. Bruce sits on her bed, stating, All I want is the truth. I don't want anyone to get hurt, I just want to help. Stephanie snaps, stating, Like how you helped the victim syndicate? Bruce remains silent, and Stephanie tells him, The first victim said that he was sorry. He didn't mean to hurt me. They wanted to make sure that I was okay. A short while later, Bruce heads to the rooftops to meet back up with Kate. He tells her that he wants everyone in the Belfry ready to strike in a moment's notice. As he leaves, Kate asks if there's anything else, and Bruce says to have the doctor come in for psych evaluations and bring Stephanie. She knows something. Later, everyone starts to gather at the tower, but as Stephanie arrives, she looks down to where Tim made his final stand. As she goes inside, Luke says that he went ahead and upgraded everyone's suit, all to combat one of the victim syndicate's abilities. As Stephanie looks at her new mask, she asks where's Batwoman. She said that they were to have a meeting, and Luke says, oh, with the shrink. Dr. Tompkins is with Clayface right now. Stephanie stops and asks, what do you mean the shrink? Stephanie then heads down the hall to see Cass is waiting outside of the evaluation room. Cass asks if she's hurt, and Stephanie says that she's okay. But moments later, Dr. Tompkins steps out asking if she's ready. Stephanie tells her, not particularly. She tells Stephanie that they just need to give it the old college try. And thinking back to Tim, Stephanie says that she's not in college. She's a superhero, remember? Elsewhere in the tower, Kate watches her father on a monitor, and Luke says that she should probably take him and speak with the doctor. It might help. Kate sarcastically asks if he has something that he should be doing, and Luke stops her asking, what is her problem? She shouts that all he does is treat the superhero thing like some fun hobby. He's never had to face the cost that any of them have had to face. That's her problem. He's only here fighting for himself. Back in the evaluation room, Stephanie sits with Dr. Tompkins, and Stephanie says that she feels somewhat indifferent on this whole boot camp thing. She also is beginning to question whether or not they are actually making an impact. Dr. Tompkins asks if this is all brought on because she was visited by the first victim, and Stephanie thinks about it and realizes something about the room. This isn't just an evaluation, it's an interrogation. Bruce calls out to Stephanie, she stops him, stating how she's sick of him pretending like he cares. He only cares when it's to cover his own ass from the things that he messed up. And for what? To be absolved for what happened to Tim? Stephanie then shouts, well she doesn't, she doesn't absolve him. And you know what? The victim syndicate is right. He proves it every time he puts on that costume. Moments later, Luke runs in stating that there's been an attack on the Tompkins Center, and Bruce tells him to get everyone ready. He turns back to Stephanie and he tells her that she's going to be grounded for this mission. They'll talk when he gets back. But as everyone leaves, Stephanie walks over to Tim's computer and begins to run a program. As she walks in the next chamber, she says that she needs to talk. Is he here? A computer program of Tim appears and tells her, always. As Bruce reaches the clinic, he sees the words, no more Batman painted across the outside, and he tells everyone to take a floor. This is ending tonight. Batman crashes through the windows, telling Jean-Paul to pull back. They've done their job. And Bruce calls out to have the first victim show himself. From the shadows, the first victim steps out asking, are you ready to stop my destruction? Bruce tells him, I know you're hurting. I know you blame me, but I'm here now. We can make this better. The first victim charges in, knocking Bruce away, telling him, there's only one way this is ever going to end, with blood on our hands. Back in the Belfry, Stephanie looks at the image of Tim and tells it that it's not real. The image says, I know. And then Stephanie asks, do you know what you are? The image says that he is a limited response program built from conversations with his creator, Red Robin. He also knows that she is Stephanie Brown, the only other person who had access to this program aside from his creator. Stephanie turns away stating, this was a bad idea. And the image tells her that he was built to listen and adapt. If they talk, he may be able to learn. Stephanie stops and begins to state that this is all wrong. The first victim came to see her to see if she was okay after the poison, but then they wanted to know why she fought with Batman. No grand scheme or plot, just why fight? At first, Batman made her want to do more. It felt good, but the violence never stops. They all never get to slow down long enough to ask themselves if what they're doing is actually helping. Stephanie then turns back to the image and asks, do you understand? And it tells her no. She begins to cry, stating how this isn't the world that she wanted. And the image asks, what is it that you want then? 
While Clayface, Kate, Cass, and Luke all fight their battles, each with a member of the Syndicate, Bruce continues battling it out with the first victim. As the fight goes on, the first victim shouts for Bruce to stop playing with him. Fight back! Bruce then asks, who are you really? But the first victim begins to fade. Before disappearing, Bruce grabs a hold and pushes them down before escaping. Soon, Kate and the rest arrive, stating that this is the end of the line, and Bruce tells her to call the police. And then a voice tells them, it's not over. And ringing blasts through everyone's comms. From the smoke, Stephanie tells Bruce, I'm sorry, but this isn't how the world is supposed to be, and I'm the only one who can fix it. Kate shouts, what are you doing, Stephanie? And Stephanie tells her, call me spoiler. What is it that I'm doing? It's in the name. Luke leaps up, telling everyone to keep the syndicate surrounded. Stephanie might be under some kind of mind control from Mr. Noxus. But as Stephanie leaps away, she tells him that she promises this is all her. Stephanie then asks, what are you all going to do? Knock me out real quick? I have a suggestion, though. And that is not to network your suit with a computer that I helped Red Robin build. Luke's suit then begins to fail and fall out of the sky. And Kate pulls out her batter rings, telling her to stomp this. Stephanie then tells her, I've always loved those taser batter rings, but I guess there's more than six in your belt. She then hits a button, shocking Kate with all of the remaining batter rings. Clayface rushes in, but Stephanie turns, creating a sonic blast, splitting him in half. Cass then runs up, pulling her mask off, asking, why? But as Stephanie turns back, she sprays a gas, putting Cass to sleep, stating that she's doing this for them. Bruce stands up asking, what about me? How are you planning on defeating me? Stephanie just laughs, stating there's no way she can beat the Batman, but she also knows that he won't hurt her. The first victim calls out for her to save them. They will take him down for her. But Stephanie punches them, telling him, shut up. You almost killed me the other night. Then pointing out the window, Stephanie says, I'm on their side, Gotham's side. She then points around, telling Bruce, Take a good look. This isn't how things are supposed to be. This destruction happened because people were chasing you. All of the sick and hurt are now huddled in an alley because of you. The first victim shouts, this is what he does. Are you happy, Batman? And Bruce shouts back, of course I'm not. I know that I failed each of you, but I will get you the help. But Stephanie tells him, that's not enough. So here's my deal. Retire as Batman, shut down the Bat Cave, hang up the capes and cows, and I won't expose the entire database on the computers to the public. People will know who Batman is. People will come hunting for you for the rest of your life. Bruce tells her, I can't. This isn't the world that we live in. We can't just stop doing what we're doing. But Stephanie tells him, it should be. Why don't we just try? Luke reaches out telling her, I wish I trusted the world like you, but we're all human and they're messy. Growing up, there was a teenager who looked like me who got shot because he looked suspicious. So I became angry, angry enough to make me want to do something about it. And every time I saw the bat signal in the sky, it gave me hope that I could. Clayface tells Stephanie, you know what I was. Doing this gives me a chance to make up for it and do more. I was a monster, but I don't want to be that anymore. Stephanie shouts, all of this isn't enough. And Bruce tells her, no, it's not, but it's what we can do. So please don't do this. From behind the group, Kate throws a battering, breaking the phone. And everyone tells her to stop this now. As the police arrive, Stephanie asks if he's going to stop this, and Bruce says that he can't. Before jumping out the window, she tells him that until he turns himself in, she will be there standing in his way the entire time. Before getting on her bike, Stephanie looks back with tears in her eyes, and Bruce watches as she drives off. A few days later, Bruce and Kate sit watching the first victim in his cell. Kate mentions that there are no records whatsoever on this guy. No name, no fingerprints, no DNA that matches anything. The orderlies let him keep the mask because looking underneath it, well, there's a reason it's there. So as the two continue to talk, Bruce mentions that with everything that's happened and those that he's lost, they may have something real special here. Tim saw the big picture better than Batman ever could. He would like to sit down and go over it with her. Kate says that they should bring Luke into that as well. She appreciated what he said earlier, but that's all she's going to say in that subject. As the two leave, Bruce says that there's one more thing. He would like her to speak with her father. It's something that she needs to do. He just lost two people that he cared about and he doesn't want to lose another. And Kate tells him that she'll try. Elsewhere, in a very far off place, an image of Tim and Stephanie brightens the darkened room as Tim works on putting together a new suit. You see, while the world thinks that Tim is dead, he's actually been kidnapped and placed in a location that we have no idea about. Once his preparations are set, Tim throws a smoke grenade out and he tries to reach everyone over his comms. He calls out, everyone, this is Tim, I'm still alive. But as he stops, he begins to see someone. Tim falls to his knees stating, I don't understand. Meanwhile, Mr. Oz watches Tim, telling him that he'll understand soon enough as they all look on the blue individual in front of Tim.
as Batman is out on patrol watching over Gotham City, Batwoman radios in saying that he can feel it too, right? How quiet the city has gotten. Actually, one of her concerns is that they're not doing enough for Cassandra. Now that Stephanie Brown is gone, she hasn't had much human contact and she spends all of her time in the mudroom, each time dialing up the threshold. Batman tells her, it's good to push yourself to the limits. And Kate sighs, saying that the issue is that she doesn't appear to have an upper limit. Batman then tells her, I'm at the mayor's place. Hattie should have evidence to put six district judges behind bars. Once this is over though, we'll take Orphan to the ballet. It should do good that she knows that someone is looking out for her. Not just as Orphan, but as Cassandra as well. Kate says that she was going to suggest a baseball game, but that works too. Batman groans. Ugh, I'm moving out. And he jumps. As he falls, a set of eyes are watching him. And as he lands on Hattie's office, he walks in to find the place torn apart by someone looking for something. He starts to look around and then he walks into the next room and that's when he sees Mayor Hattie stabbed and crucified, hanging on the wall. He hears Hattie call out and he runs over telling him, don't move, you'll just open up the wounds. Hattie struggles and he tells him, it's too late. It was the shadows, League of Shadows. Before Hattie can say any more, he draws his last breath and then the doors are kicked open as two officers shout that they got an emergency call and holy hell, Batman tells them, this is not what it looks like. And the officers say, sure, you can tell that to the commissioner when we bring you down to the central precinct. Batman throws down some smoke bombs and he jumps out the window. But one of the officers runs to that window and starts to fire. One of the bullets hits Batman in the shoulder, causing him to fall onto a nearby roof. As he picks himself back up, you can tell that there is someone else there. Later, at the Belfry, the headquarters for the team that Batman has built, Jacob Kane, Batwoman's father, who was the villain in the first story, tells both Batman and Kate through his cell that this is how the League of Shadows plays. They don't attack directly, and they never take credit for their actions. They just instill that kind of chaos that will breed the most destruction. So for them to come directly after Batman, they're planning something catastrophic, which is what the Colony was trying to prevent. The Colony is the unit that Jacob Kane had built inside of Gotham City to battle against Batman, making an army of Batman. Luckily, Batman, Batwoman, and the group that he put together involving Orphan, Clayface, Stephanie Brown, and Tim Drake managed to stop Jacob Kane. Though, Tim Drake did supposedly die in that battle. Batman shouts, I'm not gonna listen to you try and justify what you did. And Jacob stops him. Fine, don't, it's okay. But just look at my men. Look at the terror in their eyes. That is what is about to happen to Gotham. The League of Shadows will surround you as if you were ordinary frightened people. And that's when they are the most dangerous. As Batman and Batwoman walk off, Jacob tells Kate, make sure that he understands. This isn't about pride. I don't want you to die out there. Stay safe. She turns and walks off telling her father that she will. Once Batman and Kate leave, Lucas radios down that he needs them at the central computer now. Lucas is Batwing. He joined the team recently due to the loss of Tim Drake being their computer expert. As everyone gathers, they watch a recording of the news where both reporters were going over and then suddenly they started laughing until they died. Clayface watches telling everyone, oh hell. Kate looks over at the computer and says that they are getting riot reports from people in Adam Square. There are people laughing and attacking each other. Each other. Batman tells everyone, we need to get out there. But before they go, she tries to talk to Bruce. He tells her that the League of Shadows is an easy idea for it to be true. Perhaps someone is just inspired by the myth of it. And she says, or you could be wrong. Batman looks at her and he heads out telling her, or I could be wrong. A few moments later in Adam's Square, Batman and the team get to work subduing the rioters. And as they fight, Cassandra begins to notice something is wrong. Batman tells everyone that these are innocent people. You can't just let them. And Cassandra stops and shouts, no, pretending. Suddenly the rioters stop and they all turn towards the team, all with black eyes. As Cassandra starts hitting everyone's weak points, she turns back at a shadow and says, watching. But with everyone not focusing on the team, one of the men stabs into Lucas, pinning him into the wall. Azrael quickly runs over to knock the man away, but then he too is stabbed in the back. Kate tells Batman that Batwing and Azrael are down. They're losing this fight. He jumps up, throwing a set of batarangs, and he tells Clayface, we need backup. And Clayface sighs, telling him, this is going to give me a headache for about a week. He begins to shout as he splits himself into an army of smaller clay faces. And then up along a rooftop, a woman watches. And Cassandra says, watching us. Shiva looks back saying, no one sneaks up on me, but I am here for her. This is all happening because of her. So come and fight. Cassandra charges and swinging and with each attack, Shiva easily dodges and then hits her telling her to fight, stop playing games with her. Cassandra picks herself back up and she runs back in. So Shiva grabs her by the throat telling her that she knows that she could see where to hit. But instead of killing blows, she goes with a lesser strike. Why? Cassandra struggles for error, managing to say, won't 
kill. And Shiva tells her, pathetic. She then shouts Cassandra in the neck, saying that her entire nervous system is shutting down. It would have been better to never know what David Kane did to her daughter. Seconds later, Batman and Kate jump on the roof, and Batman tells Shiva to get away from Cassandra. Shiva says that he talks as if he knows her, and Batman tells her that they fought before, and I've won. Shiva prepares herself, stating that she played parts. Some parts meant to be the loser, but she is now done playing. Before Batman even has a chance to defend himself, she lunges forward, grabbing at Batman's arm and twisting it, pushing him to the ground. She tells him that she could kill him with the slightest movement, but she chooses not to so that it will hurt more. She then says that she only came here to see if her daughter was worth her attention, and she was not. She gets back up telling Batman, you just lost Gotham City. The shadows will engulf everything and the city will die. Batman throws the tracker onto her, but Shiva spins around, grabbing it out of the air, crushing it. She tells him, sad, and the smoke rises as she and the assassins disappear. Kate runs over to check on Cassandra and Clayface calls out to hurry and get back down here. Kate tells him that they know they're gone. And Clayface says, not just them, but Batwing and Azrael too. Later at the Belfry, Jacob tells Kate that she needs to hurry and get her things and run. She says that she doesn't have time for this and Jacob tells her that this little fight that they've had, that was their chance and now it's gone. The League of Shadows doesn't want anything, but Shiva is going to kill every person in Gotham. Kate asks if he's seen her because if they're going to have this talk, he needs to be completely honest. Honest. Jacob lifts his shirt showing a scar and he says that he got this one a little over a year ago when Shiva found their colony. It was only her who came and when she stabbed him it was such a precise hit that it didn't hit a single organ. She then went and killed 43 of his people in the most horrific ways and made him watch and she enjoyed it. She is made of evil. Everything about her is cold and dark so run Kate! As Kate and Jacob talk, Cassandra listens in from the control room and she grabs Batman asking, why? Why her? Later, as Batman and Kate go out to meet with Commissioner Gordon, Cassandra stays back going over all of the footage that they have on Shiva. As she watches, she begins to think that growing up, she was never allowed to even see her mother. And while watching, Clayface walks up saying that he wanted to make sure that she was okay. And she asks him, really? And he tells her, okay, maybe it was my babysitting duty. Clayface then holds out a Shakespeare book saying that, when I was young, I used to get mad and bubble things up inside. But with reading, it was a way for me to start getting that anger out. So maybe it's something you can do also. Cassandra looks at the book and Clayface goes on to tell her, If you want to go out, I'm not going to stop you, but like I could anyway. But if you do, just be safe. She hugs him, telling him, Thank you. And then she heads out from the belfry. Clayface radios over to Batman, stating that Cassandra snuck past him. And Batman tells him that he understands. Him and Batwoman will head back while he heads off to find Cassandra. Clayface says, Yeah, sure. And then a group of assassins appear behind Clayface and he says, Oh, hell. Later out in the city, Batman finds Cassandra on a rooftop and he calls out Cassandra to her. She corrects him, telling him, Orphan. And Batman tells her, No, Cassandra. I know you're not in the right state of mind right now. And she says, Stop. Name is Orphan. Bruce tells her that she isn't an orphan. She is Cassandra Kane, And she is still the daughter of David Kane and Lady Shiva and still a good person. They don't decide who she is. Cassandra kicks Bruce back, telling him, Stop. And Bruce asks if she wants to fight. She scans him and says, yes. And she begins swiping and punching away at Batman. He wipes some blood from his mask, telling her that he won't fight her. He believes in her. And she screams, no! And she kicks Batman off of the ledge. He crawls back up as she escapes. But before Batman can chase her, he gets a call from Alfred. Alfred says that there's something wrong. He thinks someone may be here. And then there's a sudden crash over the radio. Back over at the Belfry, Kate comes back to find Clayface in pieces on the floor. She goes to check on him as she feels something slam into the back of her head. Down below in the cells, Jacob sits and sees Kate's body thrown in front of him. One of the assassins tells Jacob that Shiva said he was to watch. Kate starts to wake up asking what's going on and then the assassin slams the katana down into her stomach. Also, during this time back in the city, Cassandra lands in the middle of a crowd shouting for Shiva. A few moments later, Shiva leaves down asking, what do you want? And Cassandra pulls back her mask asking, why? Abandoned. Me. Shiva laughs, saying, He really did it, didn't he? It's like the verbal language is something forced and unnatural for you. Reading movements was the first language that David taught you. You can see death, right? Cassandra tells her, Yes. And Shiva says that she can too, but it only matters if she chooses to wield it. She stands back readying herself, telling Cassandra to fight like she knows she can. Fight to kill! And she will give her the answer that she wants. Back at the Batcave, Batman speeds in shouting for Alfred! And as he looks at the monitors, he sees on the monitors the footsteps from the entire team being defeated. Clayface was being taken down by assassins, Kate being stabbed, and now Cassandra left in the streets as everyone surrounds her and beats her. And a voice tells Bruce, Welcome home. And Bruce turns around to ask, Who? 
and Raz al Ghul tells him, who else but me? Bruce charges at Raz, shouting, where are they? And Raz tells Ubu to calm him. The man Ubu with Raz reaches over and grabs Batman, throwing him away. Ubu walks over to hit him, and as he does, Batman grabs his arm and brings his elbow down, snapping Ubu's arm. Batman then tells the computer to activate the cage, and suddenly an electric field shoots up around Raz. Raz laughs, saying that it appears you've mistaken my intent by coming here. Batman pauses for a moment and then says, you're not working with them. If you were, you would have drawn me out in the heart of the plan. Raz tells him, that's rather obvious. There was a larger mystery at play here. Batman says, the League of Shadows isn't supposed to exist. It was a boogeyman myth that you created to frighten your own men into submission. Raz says, come on, you can put the pieces together, right? And Batman grabs him through the cage shouting, what did you do? What did you do? Back at the Belfry cells, Jacob beats in the glass until his hands are bloody, screaming for Batman to let him out. But as if he was answered, the cells open. Cooper says that maybe Batman listened to him, and Jacob says that if he had spent a decade studying Batman like him, he would know that that's not true. They aren't alone. A light shines on his men, and a voice tells them, You sure aren't. Ulysses Hardy and Armstrong steps out, stating, I'm the one leading the cavalry. Jacob grabs his gun from one of the soldiers, and he says that the League of Shadows is getting ready to sink Gotham. It might be too late for them to save the city, but they will sure make sure that the League dies with it. Now get him back to his command deck. Meanwhile, back at the Batcave, Roz taunts Bruce, telling him, just so you know, I could leave this cell, but I'm choosing not to. Batman shouts, asking, how did all of this happen? And Roz smiles, telling him, you've gotten so close to the real secrets. You caught a glimpse of the world as I see it. I created the League of Assassins so I could be in favor with the powerful and wealthy. However, I did need to rule them from the shadows. There have been three times where you stepped into those shadows and you learned of the League of Shadows. And each time to stop you, we had to use magic and trickery to make you forget. The woman who led them, Shiva, played her role well and gave the assassins purpose and drive. However, she turned them against me and she started using them for her own plans of destruction. Batman stares at Roz and he says, You don't know how to beat her, do you? And Roz looks away telling him, You know she must be beaten. Roz then tells Bruce to take down these silly walls. And I will give you the upper hand in defeating them. Batman waits and then he calls to the computer to deactivate. As the field drops, Roz tells Ubu to go ahead. As Ubu starts typing on the computer, Batman asks, what is he doing? And Roz says, deactivating the cave's defenses. They allowed the League of Shadows to follow them. Batman runs over to try and stop Ubu, but Roz blows a mist in his face, causing it to paralyze him. Suddenly, footsteps can be heard and Roz leans down whispering, there is one final trick taught to me by an old friend. Remember, F. Suwadasha. Batman's eyes widen and Roz tells Batman, end this. Within seconds, the entire room is filled with assassins and Shiva walks through the crowd to the front. Roz bows and then he picks up Batman saying, here he is and as per the terms of our agreement, a full ceasefire between our people shall be made to allow you to burn Gotham to the ground. I trust that our business is now complete. And Shiva says, for now. And she snaps her fingers. The smoke fills the entire room and as it fades, Shiva, the assassins, and Batman are all gone. And down on the sewers, Cassandra tears through a group of shadow assassins. Meanwhile, in another part of the sewers, Kate slowly begins to wake up and struggle with the chains that are wrapped around her. Lucas tells her not to move too much. She is still bleeding, and they are strapped under the largest thermal nuclear device outside of what he's seen in a textbook. The good news is that she's got company. The problem that they face now is that they are on the fault line, and within 24 hours, the center of the city is going to erupt from below, and everything will collapse. Kate asks, what about Clayface? And Lucas motions over to the hanging canisters and says that he's spread out across those. She then asks why are they alone, and Lucas says that they aren't. Just focus on the shadows in front of them. He goes on saying, don't worry, Batman is still out there. And just as he says that, Shiva throws Batman's body on the ground and tells the assassins to search him and chain him up with the others. Bruce tries to ask why, and Shiva tells him that the morning shows start on the East Coast in over an hour. She wants to make sure that she maximizes the horror of it when Gotham City dies live on television, and he will die first. One of the assassins steps out and tells Shiva that they are picking up a disturbance in the West Tunnel. Suddenly, the lights go out, and Cassandra rips into the room, cutting away the chains around everyone and the canisters holding Clayface. She then stops on the one last assassin, and she Shiva calls out, daughter. Before Cassandra could do anything, Shiva grabs her by the throat and holds her up, asking if she really wishes to humiliate herself again, or is this supposed to somehow impress her? Cassandra struggles and says, it does. And Shiva tosses her body, saying that it does not impress her to see a knife that refuses to stab or a gun that refuses to fire. Cassandra gets up staring at her, saying, yes, it does. Shiva asks if she has deluded herself into thinking that she can beat her one-on-one, -on -one, and Cassandra smiles, saying, no, not alone. Shiva points, telling her that she will always be alone. 
and Batman's boot kicks into the back of her, telling her, no, she won't. And with everyone rallying behind her, Cassandra says, Shiva, stop now. Shiva pulls out her katana, shouting, I have done so many evil things, and I will continue to do more, but that is not why I am here, and Shiva will never yield. Shiva quickly runs in and kicks Kate where she was stabbed, and Batman tells Clayface to get Kate out of here. As Shiva moves into the next person, she kicks Azrael, saying, My daughter lacks perspective. When one finds a cancer, you don't beat it into submission, you cut it out before it kills you. As she swings down on Batman, Cassandra jumps in the path, blocking it, telling her, No. After being pushed away, Shiva says, It's time to end this! And she pulls out a device, pressing a button. An announcement plays off, stating, Activated. Five minutes to detonation. And Shiva asks, What now, Batman? Batman calls out to Lucas, telling him that he needs him to do the impossible. And Lucas tells him, Yeah, I figured. While Lucas and Azrael try to defuse the bomb, Cassandra goes back to swinging at Shiva, and she tells her, You are nothing more than a broken weapon. And Cassandra shouts, I am more! I could see death! I choose life! She then punches Shiva, going on, telling her, You think best hits are kill. I think best hits hurt. Shiva tries to get back up, and Cassandra kicks her in the stomach and continues to beat her down. She then cries out, asking, Burn! My city! My friends! Why? And Shiva looks at her for a moment and then says, You wouldn't understand. And Cassandra leans down with a sincere look, telling her, Yes, I could. But before Shiva could say another word, a gun goes off, hitting her in the back. Roz walks out, saying, You've all done a marvelous job here. But I felt that I earned the final shot, since it was my rabid dog, after all. Cassandra gets up, charging at Roz, and Batman grabs her, telling her, Stand down. Roz smiles, saying, We should make a deal. In exchange for taking the League of Shadows and making sure that they stay trapped, I will disarm the bomb for you. Batman groans and says, I want you to understand something. You let me glimpse something here that you thought that you didn't want me to see. This isn't over. Shiva starts to crawl up, telling Cassandra to come close. And as Cassandra leans down, she whispers something and then asks if she understands. Cassandra tells her, yes. Shiva says, good, good. As Roz's men come in and take everyone away, Roz looks at Cassandra and says, you have much fire in your eyes. I hope to see it again. A week later at the Belfry, Kate walks over to Batman at the computer, telling him that she's glad she found him here. She was starting to think that they would have to cancel their plans. She then sits back down, saying that she went ahead and sent Batwing, Azrael, and Clayface on a patrol. With all the tension in the city, it's like everyone knew something bad was about to happen. Batman tells her, I know how they feel, but there's so much that doesn't make sense. Memories that are now coming into focus, but this isn't the end. This is only the beginning. Kay says an evening at the ballet would be good for both of them, and then she says that she'll meet them both there. Though she's handling the situation well, Kate finds herself going back down to her father's cell, expecting him to come back and lock himself up. Batman looks off, stating that all of this is connected. The Colony, the League of Shadows, Ra's al Ghul, they're all pieces to a puzzle that's only just now taking shape, and he knows where to start. He waits for a moment, and then he says, Many years ago, during his training, he went down a dark road, tried to use a weapon that he should have never touched. And that weapon is magic, and Ra's used it against him. But now it's the weapon that they're going to need to face Ra's al Ghul. A long time ago, Dick Grayson was given a set of photos revealing that someone knew who he was. Dick asked the young boy what's going on, and the boy said that they both know things haven't been right since Jason's death. Bruce Wayne needs to remember who he used to be. He needs a Robin. Dick then asks the boy who he is, and in current times, a voice says, Tim Jackson Drake. Why go to them after all of these years? Tim responds, telling Mr. Oz that Batman was out of control. Losing fights that he could have won in his sleep, he was hurting people. There has always been a darkness in Batman, something almost corrosive. But without Jason, without a Robin, that darkness was consuming him. I went to Dick because he may have been impressed with my knowledge. I was hoping to convince him to wear the Robin costume once more, but he obviously didn't listen, did he? Dick had decided that he would help Bruce's Nightwing, but that didn't fix what Bruce really needed. Oz asks, if that was the case, why did the responsibility fall to you to become Robin? Why did it have to be you? Tim says it was because he was the one who saw what needed to happen when no one else did. He knew who they were. How couldn't he act? How could he not become Robin? Oz then asks, if that's the case, why did you choose to leave it all behind? Tim goes on telling him that he had to help Batman build some kind of supported system, one to fight crime in a way that he never had before, one that wouldn't need him there. Everyone thinks that Batman is this solitary hero, but the truth is, he's never truly been alone since Robin. Now with this system that he built, Batman will never run short of help. 
An image appears on the screen of the Bat family fighting villains, and Oz says, Ah, yes. Your friends? And Tim tells him, See? It works without me even being there to do anything. The image changes to Batman as he works at the computer, and Oz tells him that ever since he learned that Tim Drake was alive, he's been searching. He hasn't slept in five nights. His search consumes him. Oz then says, My question was never fully answered. Why was it that the costume was hung up? Tim pauses for a moment, and then he says, It's because... I could never become Batman. I've known that from the beginning. I never wanted to go down that route. And Oz tells him, that's right. It's because you fear it. That's why such intricate systems are made, to manage it from afar. And Tim shouts, that's enough. The system will hold. The fact that it's held this long. And Oz finishes the sentence telling him, it's meaningless. Tim then says, I'm done being interrogated. And Oz tells him, you could have not said a word and stood there silently. But Tim starts smiling, telling him, no, you misunderstand. I was allowing myself to be interrogated, and now I'm done. It uses less brain power to tell the truth, and because of that, I've been multitasking. Screens begin to light up, showing the Red Robin logo, and Tim works at the controls in his glove, stating, it took me a while to reprogram these computers. But that was when I remembered a bit of Kryptonian coding theory that I deciphered with Batman a few years back. Tim jumps out of Oz's hold, and then he attacks him, telling him, who are you? And how do you have this kind of technology? Trust me, I am the smartest and most dangerous teenager and I have a back door into your systems. I want to know everything. I want to know what kind of prison this is and why you brought me here and how I get out. Oz's eyes shine and he asks, You want to know the terrible secret? Oz knocks Tim to the ground, pulling back the cloak, telling him that he is just as much of a prisoner in this place as he is. Tim looks at the crest on Oz's chest and he says, No, you can't be. And Oz tells him, That's right, I am Jor-El, father of Kal-El, known to you as Superman. He goes on telling Tim, I see a lot of myself in you. Though, you may not understand it, I was trying to save you. This need in your heart to save them, this is what turned his eye towards you. For once in your life, make the selfish decision and don't go back. Suddenly, jor begins to fade and he says that at this moment, his eyes have turned elsewhere. It is time to put my plot into motion. I implore you, stay and reflect your life. I have something else to do. And with a bright green flash, jor disappears, and Tim jumps up shouting for him to wait! I don't understand! If you want to know where jor going, that's the Superman story, The Oz Effect. I'll link it down below. Tim frantically tries to reconnect the computer as a way to send out a message, telling Bruce that he doesn't want to be here anymore. Go find him! After a few moments, a response comes in and Batman tells him, I'm a prisoner here too. Use the computer to open up the containment cells in Corridor 6A. Tim says, wait, that's where I was. And Batman tells him, there isn't much time before Oz returns. Tim sets the computer to unlock the cells and begins running back towards his cells, shouting, I did it! The cells are open! And as Tim steps through, Batman says, it's really you. And Tim smiles, telling him, I'm so relieved you're here. We gotta get out of here. But before they can go, there's a thumping sound, and Batman pushes Tim to the ground, telling him, get down! And he takes out a gun and begins to fire. Tim asks, what the... And Batman yells, I told you just to open up the containment cells in this corridor, not the whole damn place. Tim says, wait, this is all wrong. Batman would never use a... And Batman stops him, telling him, right and wrong are subjective. This gun murdered Thomas and Martha Wayne. It's been rebuilt, and now it's being redeemed as a tool that was once evil. Tim steps back, stating, you, you can't be Bruce. And Batman tells him, no. He pulls back the cowl, and the man inside is the Timothy Drake of tomorrow. Now get behind me! We're not the only prisoners here! Suddenly, there's a rumble from the wall as Doomsday breaks through, charging right at the two Tims. Tim quickly jumps into action, and Doomsday easily knocks him to the ground. Timothy, the older Batman version, loads up a green cartridge and begins to fire on Doomsday until he's actually stopped moving. Timothy helps Tim up, stating, That's only a synthetic kryptonite. It won't keep him down forever. If you want to live, we gotta leave now. As the two leave, Tim asks, When did you figure out how to break Doomsday's skin? And Timothy says, it all started when I was around your age, maybe a little younger. It was around the time that I also realized that no matter how hard I trained, I would never be on the same level as Bruce, Dick, or the other Robins. But what I did know was that I was smarter than them, so I created shortcuts and cheats. Everything I need to take down anyone is stored in this suit at all times. Right now, though, we need to move quickly before our window is gone. And Tim asks, what window? 
Timothy explains, I've been trapped in this place for the equivalent of a year. Obviously, we are outside of the confines of hyperspace since we're both here at the same time. The Titans in my time used a modified boom tube teleport system that I built into the suit's computer, so if we get the right frequency that Oz just used to leave, we might be able to mimic it. Tim stops him. Whoa, 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 wait. This is a lot to process. Is a future me, your Batman, you're angry and you're using a gun? Timothy tells him, no, you've already processed it. You just don't like what you've processed. Tim tells him, you don't know what I'm thinking. Timothy tells him, actually, I do. I remember having this same conversation. Well, perhaps we should say an echo of it, but either way, duck! Just then, Doomsday starts running towards them, and Timothy uses the suit to lock down the security doors near them one at a time. Tim asks, what did you mean by an echo? And Timothy tells him, back when I was Robin, I had this conversation with myself as well. The circumstances were different, but it happened. Tim stops to think, none of this makes sense. I would never become you. I would never become the Batman. And Timothy then asks, who? Who takes Gotham when Bruce dies? Dick steps in for a bit, but he does what he does and he moves on. Jason tried, but he lost an eye and a leg, and more importantly, his will to live. Damien took the cow, but he nearly burned the city to the ground. And Tim asks, what did he do to you? Timothy tells him, I did what I always do. I did what was necessary. Tim shouts that he's a monster, and Timothy says that morality isn't as black and white as you may think. Gotham needed a Batman, and at the end of the day, there was no one else. And Tim asks, what about Batwoman? And Timothy yells, especially her! God, to still be so trusting! Batwoman isn't the person that you think she is, and you're gonna learn that soon enough. But while the two argue, Doomsday charges back in, and Tim says, I got it this time. A flash appears, and a projection of Superman floats in front of Doomsday. The projection then flies off, and Timothy holds his hand out, telling Tim that they need to hurry. Take my hand so that we can leave. A green light surrounds the two of them, and suddenly Tim looks around Gotham alleyways, asking, Am I really home? Timothy tells him it should be, and you should thank me but at the risk of sounding rude, it's probably time that I get back to my own timeline. Timothy turns and he begins walking off and then he stops and he says, before I go, there's something I wished I could have done back in your shoes. Tell Connor that I'm sorry for everything. Tim stands and he asks, who's Connor? Timothy doesn't answer. He quickly begins to access the timeline to see the current Bat family and he begins to talk to himself. Tim yells, what are you going on about? And Timothy quickly spins back, slashing Tim's arm with a battering. Timothy then rips his glove, seeing the same scar on him, and he says that this means he can be free. Oh, thank God I can be free. Before Tim has a chance to ask what that even means, Timothy releases a paralytic shock, stunning Tim, and he tells him, I'm sorry, but I can't leave yet. I can free you from becoming what I am now by starting with the person responsible for setting my life in this path. I must stop the person responsible for the fall of the Batman. I must kill Batwoman. Meanwhile, back at the Batcave, Batman is going over the footage of Tim, telling the computer to play it over and over again, trying to figure out where he is. Alfred comes back down telling Batman that he needs to sleep even for just a few hours. If not, he will use some of Dr. Crane's neurotic gases on him. Batman says that he's already lost too much time. The answers are not coming in fast enough. He takes his coffee and he replays the events leading up until now when there's suddenly a ping at the computer. He continues to self-loathe when Alfred says that it is a distress call coming from Master Tim's costume. It's here in Gotham. Without saying a word, Batman races out of the cave and onto the streets where the beacon is coming from, and when he arrives in the alleyway, he finds Tim's costume, but no Tim. He looks around to see a hospital, and as he runs in, the doctors are already attempting to revive Tim. He storms into the examination room as Bruce Wayne, telling the doctors to get out. He is the boy's legal guardian. Also, he owns the hospital. You all need to get out right now. He hurries over to hug Tim, and the weekly Tim tells him, You have to go. I didn't come back alone, and where's Kate? Later at the Belfry, the base of everyone in the Batman team in the Detective Comics, Batwoman comes in to hear everyone talking and asks Luke what's going on. Luke says that she's just gonna have to see for herself, and then she sees Tim. Wasting no time, Batman tells everyone to take a seat, and Tim says that he's going to need everyone to take this for face value. They don't have time to deal with the implausibility of it, but there's a very dangerous future version of himself in Gotham. In his time, he was forced to take up the mantle of Batman, and he is not happy about that. He believes that he can prevent it from happening here in the present by killing the person who put it all in motion. He's here to kill Batwoman. Batwoman looks at Tim and asks, how personally should I be taking this? Later, Batwoman says that she really doesn't like the idea of being put in a cage. She's not a child who needs protecting. And Tim says that he knows, but trust him. This also means that he knows what he knows, and he knows that she'll be coming right for him. A few hours ago, he took down Doomsday with his own hands. Not to sound blunt, but I could kill any one of you in here if you don't prepare. He's basically the worst parts of me in one person with two decades of more intelligence and experience. 
Batwoman tells him, charming. And Tim tells her, I would say that you should meet him, but I'm literally redesigning the shield door so that doesn't happen. A little while later, Tim returns to Batman asking if there have been any traces of him yet, because honestly, he thought that he would have been here already. Batman looks at the window stating that as someone who's lost a lot in life, if he was given a chance to see his world before it all changed, he would revel in the sight. Tim goes on telling him, that could be anything. We're talking about two decades worth of missing time. Timothy also talked about a friend that he should have, someone named Connor. Though I don't know who that is, I feel the name tugging at my heart. Batman asks, where would you go? Have you felt lost in a world that was so different, but so very much the same? Tim pauses and says that he would go to the only place that he ever felt home. And over in Wayne Manor, Alfred tends to the garden when a voice tells him, Hello. Alfred turns back to see Batman, but not Bruce Wayne, Timothy. And he pulls down the mask, telling Alfred, No, it's only me. Alfred gasps, asking him, What happened to you? And Timothy tells him, Your Tim is with Bruce. He's the same person. I'm just a few decades down the road. Alfred steps back, asking, I never thought it would be you. I never thought that you would bear the cow. Timothy pulls the mask back, telling him, Neither did I, but I need to ask you something. If there was something that I could do, something that would free me from being Batman, but something terrible, really terrible, should I do it? Alfred asks, what are you going to do? But before Timothy can answer, a voice tells him, we can answer that. You're going back to where you belong. Nightwing, Red Hood, and Damien appear before Timothy, and Timothy tells them, you're all so young and stupid. Alfred quickly runs upstairs to send word to Batman and the others, and moments later, Batman speeds into the cave asking what's going on. Before Alfred could give him a full answer, Nightwing, Damien, and Red Hood all come crashing down into the cave. Tim yells out to Timothy that he doesn't need to do this. He's good, but he can't beat the real Batman no matter how smart he is. Just let us help you. Let us work through whatever this is together. And Timothy laughs, asking, Did you really think that I would come to the Batcave just to tie up some residual emotions for a life that I lost decades ago? You really are naive. I came here because the Bat computer is connected to a half-built program that helped me create the future. Batman won't finish it for a while, but after that I will spend years perfecting it. It doesn't even need a satellite in my time. It runs through my suit. Batman quietly tells him, No. And Red Hood asks, What the hell are you starting to build? Timothy smiles, telling him, Let me show you. Activate! And the computers all change into a blue eye, and it responds that Brother Eye is online! Meanwhile, over in the Atlantic Ocean, Ulysses Armstrong, the individual from the Army of the Batman storyline at the beginning, is working on his own Red Robin costume, when suddenly his computers change to Brother Eye. He runs over to his terminal, trying to block the Brother Eye from connecting, but the computers all respond. Drone fleet activated. Target Catherine Kane, Batwoman, the Belfry. Ulysses heads out, telling them that he needs to report to the Colonel, and then he stops, stating that, Maybe I can finally see what my toys can do. Back in the Batcave, the fight begins with all five of the present-day Bat family members against Timothy Drake of the future. Red Hood pulls out a knife, stating that he's sorry to do this, bud. However, before Red Hood could even strike, Timothy tells him that in just a few years, he's gonna learn that one of his bones was never set right after the Joker killed him. There's a growing, debilitating bone spur in his hip joint. He found it for him, so you're welcome. He hits him in the hip, and Nightwing swings in, asking, why are you doing this? Why not just come with us? And Timothy deflects the hit, telling him, because the problem is bigger than you think. The problem isn't with any of you in particular, except maybe Damien. He should be killed on sight for what he does to the poor Kent boy. Damien jumps in asking, what are you talking about? And Timothy then punches him to the ground. But before Timothy can attack again, there's a distortion that pulls out him and he screams in pain. Tim asks what's going on and Timothy pulls his mask back shouting, I don't have time for this. Will you all just get it into your thick skulls that Batman is a curse? Batman jumps into attack, but Timothy tells him, you worry about it every night, that each of them are more broken than when you found them. You're gonna die, still afraid of that truth. I should know, my Bruce told me on his deathbed. Go ahead and say it's a lie. Batman pauses for hesitation, and Timothy releases an electrical charge into Batman's suit, stating, I thought not. Timothy then tells Brother Eye to go ahead and clean up everything, and suddenly all of the Batmobiles activate. Over in the Belfry, Luke says that he's got something incoming, and he's pretty sure it's something that they've run into before. Batwoman looks at the screen and says that it's the Colonel Drone Fleet that can level buildings. Just then, Brother Eye says that the security system is compromised, and Batwoman's cell is deactivated. Right after that, the explosion goes off, and Batwoman tells everyone to get back, and Cassandra says, no, together. Back at the Batcave transit system, Tim follows Timothy down, telling him that he should have thought of another way to the Belfry without using a transportation system that he built. And Timothy kicks Tim into the carts, asking, Why would I have done that? I wanted you to follow me. You should be smart enough to know that you can't defeat me alone. Now that I want to. Timothy yells in pain as the distortion begins to pull at him again, and Tim asks what is going on. Timothy turns back, kicking Tim, telling him, It's the hyper time fighting back. The time stream doesn't want to be changed, and the more that I interact with the past, the more that it tries to assert itself and send me home. 
Tim tells him, I can't let you do anything. And Timothy grabs him, telling him, I will be free! Free! Like I haven't been since the day that I decided that Batman was losing himself in the wake of Jason's death. Tim struggles, yelling, You know that I can't let you do that! And Timothy says, Yes, I know! Goodbye! With one swift chop to the neck, Tim falls to the ground. And inside of the Belfry, everyone is getting ready to fight against the drones when Timothy jumps into the middle of the fight, telling Brother Eye to make a cage. He needs to finish this himself. An energy dome appears to build around the two of them, Timothy and Batwoman, and Batwoman says, apparently, I'm gonna do something to piss you off pretty bad in the future. Timothy shouts, no, you disappoint me, just as you disappoint everyone. I used to think so highly of you, but it's the confidence in your voice, the way you hold yourself, is that you have no idea what you're doing and you're going to destroy people People, but now it's over. As Timothy holds out his gun, a battering flies in, knocking it out of his hand, and Tim walks through the shattered cage, telling him, not yet. Timothy looks back, asking, how are you doing this? I built these computers. And Luke walks up, telling him, yeah, he also rebuilt them. Your younger self funneled control of the base into my subsystems. Brother I has no power in the Belfry. Timothy shouts, no. As the time stream begins to pull at him and Tim and Batwoman take a chance to beat him down. Outside, Batman, using the older model vehicles that he designed, get to work taking out the drones. And all Timothy can do is watch his plans crumble. As the smoke clears, Tim stands with Timothy telling him, this whole building was our dream and it still can be. And Timothy begins to hold his head and cry, stating, it won't. None of it's going to work. You're going to see it fall apart in your own hands. The time stream begins to light back up and Timothy puts the mask back on, telling his younger self, make sure to hold on to everything as long as you can, because this is all going to be over so much sooner than you can imagine. And with that, future Timothy disappears. As Tim stands there, Batman reports in asking, what happened? Did Timothy return to his time? Tim, what's going on? In the wake of the recent events, Gotham City has appointed Michael Atkins as the new mayor. During a press conference, the reporters gather around to ask the question on everyone's mind. What is his view on Batman's secret vigilante army roaming the streets of Gotham? Michael says that he could not ignore the fact that their city at times sees threats that are beyond that of anything ordinary in which they require extraordinary persons to handle them. However, in the terms of the Batmen acting as a paramilitary group, they do not need it. Gotham City has a police force. It does not need a second. As the news continues to highlight Mayor Atkins' speech, Stephanie, the woman known as Spoiler, visits anarchy in prison. Stephanie hears the TV and says that it's funny. They were fine with one Batman, even a Robin, but a group? Anarchy tells her that it's nice to think that there's someone out there looking out for them, but a military strike force? That's bigger than any one person. So the people in Gotham have a right to be afraid. It's a healthy response to what's presented before them. But it also makes the people question the status quo, allowing the people to take back the power and wield it for themselves. As Anarchy, he never set out to hurt anyone, just empower them, which is why the first victim told him to seek her out. He saw her potential. Stephanie gets up from the table stating that she should go, but Anarchy stops her, telling her that he's sorry. It's just, if she really engaged in the Victim Syndicate's ideology, she joined them. The Victim Syndicate was more than five people. It was a movement, and it's growing. These are the victims, the individuals that have been hurt in Batman's war on crime. There's more than five. Anarchy then hands a piece of paper to Stephanie, telling her that in a few weeks, go to this address and see for herself. And after that, she can make a decision. Later that night, Stephanie suits up to go out into the night, telling herself that when she was with everyone, it did feel right. Punching the bad guys in the head, saving the world, it wasn't as simple as just believing in it. It was much harder to maintain. And then there's a knock at the door. Stephanie quietly says that no one should know about this place. And as she opens it up, the voice tells her that he had this whole thing that he was ready to say. He should start off by telling her how much he missed her. It's Tim Drake, and he spoke with Batman regarding the victim syndicate. All of it. He's so sorry that he hurt. But tears of joy stream down her cheek as she tells the voice to just shut up and kiss her. She runs out grabbing Tim and kissing him as he tries to go on, apologize that he didn't come to her right away. He's learned so much. He's seen the mistakes. He knows how to improve the Gotham Knights protocol. Stephanie then says that he can finally let it go. Go to an Ivy University like he was supposed to. She's been thinking about it too. They should hang up the capes and find a better way to help people. Tim smiles, telling her, first, he needs to finish what he started. And he wants her help to do it. So how about they go save the world? Weeks go by, and Tim and Kate learn of the meaning of the villains, and they wait for the perfect time to strike. While they sit, Kate says that she has a really bad feeling about this. He hasn't told Stephanie that he's not going back to school, has he? Tim pauses and says that he doesn't want to overwhelm her. And Kate says no, he doesn't want her to yell at him. 
He's the reason why she's back in the fold. And it's only because she thinks that it's temporary. She thinks they're both going to quit. Take it from her, someone who is usually the crappy partner in a relationship. He's being that crappy partner in a relationship right now. It's obvious that he has no desire to hand over the keys to the Belfry. And soon, she's going to see that as well. How will she handle him wanting to become the next Batman? Tim says that he won't become him. The future version tried to kill her. And maybe instead of denying it all, he can just accept it and shape it. Kate tells him that's great. All she's saying is don't piss off the girlfriend. Now let's get this over with. Meanwhile, over at Mayor Atkins' office, Batman steps out from the curtains and he tells the mayor, congratulations, mayor. Michael Atkins says that he was wondering when he would show up. It's been weeks. He's starting to have hurt feelings. He then pulls on an envelope and in it are pictures of Clayface, free from Arkham, working with the Belfry. Michael tells him that this whole military thing isn't going to work. And to make matters worse, he has a known murderer and criminal within his ranks. So there's one question that he wants to ask and he wants an honest answer. When does this end, Batman? Back over in Arkham. Anarchy looks out the window, stating that the city is boiling over. Stephanie was so close to seeing through their lies. As the first victim suited up, he says that it's because the boy returned. She is damaged and has provided them with the ammunition to set everything in motion. Gave them the images to light the fire of fear. Soon, they will stoke that fire and they will finally learn what it means to be a victim. Later, out in the streets, the team moves into position to stop a speeding truck on the freeway. As Azrael cuts the corner of the back of the truck off, he looks at Luke, asking, what does he see in there? Luke flies down, telling him that he thinks it looks like a truckload of cyber assassins. Man, is that not the coolest sentence I've ever said in my life? Just then, those assassins spring out of the truck and they begin jumping as Batman and Kate are following closely behind. As they move in, Batman begins to notice something. Their stances. They're moving like different members of their team. Luke scans them and says, yeah, they are. Each of them seems to have footage of the movements of the Belfry members in the past few months. Someone is using a program using the methods of the Batman team. Batman fights off one of the assassins and he goes on stating that Mayor Atkins has images of them as well. Someone is trying to weaponize the very idea of their team. Meanwhile, over at Dr. Victoria October's lab, she speaks to Clayface, telling him that if her calculations are correct, which they are, he will soon once again become Basil Carla, the movie star handsome actor with total control over his own mind and body because it will no longer be made out of chemical sludge. Clayface asks, Can we just call it clay? Sludge makes me feel dirty. Victoria says that soon he won't have to call it anything. Tomorrow, the test batch should be ready. And once that's complete, it should only be a few days until everything is ready to finish this. Clayface says that there's also another like him, an old friend named Glory Griffin. She got hurt real bad and has the same condition as him without any control over it. She deserves to have her life back as well. After all, he was the one that took it from her. Hell, why is she even doing this for him? She's seen how bad he can get, the kind of damage that he's caused. No matter what this cure does, he'll always feel the pain. And even after all of this, what happens if the darkness is still there? What if he's just going to stay a murderous monster? Victoria tells him that he'll know for sure soon. And that kind of knowledge is tremendously powerful. She knows a little something about changing something fundamental in your own body. Before she transitioned, she thought that it might be a cure for everything that she considered wrong with her, but it wasn't. She's still every bit the prickly pear that she was beforehand. There are still nights where she gets lost in doubt and depression, and she knows that those are parts of her, not just a symptom of the body that she was living inside. Later, over in Kate's hideout, Kate looks at the cut that she received and then hears a voice telling her that it looks like she could use a hand. Kate's father, Colonel Jacob Kane of the Colony, steps in stating that he was waiting in the next room. It looks like it's going to take a while. He can help stitch her back up. Her father's currently on the run after creating his own military group of Batmen. That story is in the links down below for Detective Comics. Kate leans over the table to allow her father to work and tells him sure. Before she knew that he was running an illegal covert military operation out of Gotham, Jacob tells her yeah. Before he knew that she signed up for the same damn thing but just a different side of the table. The Batman side. He finishes the sutures and tells her actually. There's another reason I came here. After hearing how my drones attacked you, I expelled my weapons developer Ulysses Armstrong from the colony. But there's something else. He puts a jump drive into a computer and goes on telling her that he got a message the other day and he would like her to see it herself. The screen lights up and on it, an image of Tim appears and he says, this message is for Colonel Jacob Kane. I have a proposal for you, a way that we might be able to work together. Jacob stops it and tells her, there's something happening at Gotham. Forces at work much bigger than any of us, and if the boy doesn't stop, someone is going to get hurt. Back in the Belfry, Tim sits at a computer and Stephanie asks what's wrong. Why did she get an emergency request? Tim tells her that he needs to know why she did it. She knows how important all of this is to him and there's footage of them fighting. 
After reviewing it, he can pinpoint the exact perspective of the shots taken. It was from her phone. She shouts, excuse me? You're wrong and it sucks that you didn't just come asking me about it before confronting me. Tim explains that it would match her MO exactly. It was her that told Batman what she would do during the victim syndicate attacks. Who else would perfectly frame her? Stephanie tells Tim to pull up her phone's core programming. As the lines of code begin to display, she shows him Money Spider, AKA Lonnie, AKA Anarchy. Tim asks, what, Lonnie McKinn? Anarchy? What does this have to do with him? And she tells Tim that she's going to go and find out and he doesn't get to come with her. She's leaving. Tim tells her to wait, leave the Belfry, the team, or him. She turns back from the door, telling him she'll get back to him on that. He sits back down at the computer, hitting the council, shouting, damn it! And then he tells the computer to pull up the feet of Anarchy in Arkham. As the screen changes, he sees that not only is Anarchy's room empty, but the entire cell block is empty. Over in Arkham, Clayface sits with Glory, telling her that he knows that he can't take away what he's done, but there might be something that can make her life a little easier. He's been working with his doctor and she might be able to fix all of this. Glory turns back telling him that that's not what she wants. She doesn't want to go back to the person that she was. She wants people to see him and remember the monster that he is. Suddenly guards charge into the room, shocking Clayface and Glory goes on stating that a few minutes ago, every news agency in Gotham received a dossier. Inside it is proof that the wanted criminal Clayface is working with Batman. The people will finally understand what the victim syndicate has been saying from the beginning. Clayface shouts, asking, why are you doing this? And Glory takes a collar and states, because she can't stand the idea that he gets to walk free from all of this. The people need to know who he is, and soon, they will. Now, later, as everyone gathers in the Belfry, they watch the news as the victim syndicate leaks out information about the team. Tim asks, I wasn't around the first time, what do they want? And Batman tells them that they want him to unmask live on television. Give up Batman once and for all. Prevent innocent lives getting caught in the crossfires. Stephanie then says, this is partially her fault. Those were her photos that were getting plastered out there. They were fanatics. And there's a lot more of them than the group thinks. Stephanie changes the images on the screen to show people in the streets protesting and says that after scanning social networks, people are getting angry. They feel out of control and they want to blame something. Valid or not, they are blaming Batman. Hundreds of people are pouring into the streets, all dressed up like the first victim. They're calling this Victim's Day. Anarchy is making this into a movement. And them finding out about Clayface? Well, Batman teaming up with a villain, it did the job. They're scared and they want this all to end now. Luke projects a hologram of the city street stating that they have to shut off some of the security cameras. And going with that, they can get a general idea of where they're at. Tim looks at the projection and says that if they enter from the east and the north wing simultaneously, they can sweep the hole. But a voice talks over him telling him that she has an idea. Kate says that the Colony airship is a mile outside of Gotham Harbor. Why don't they call Colony back in? Kate jumps down and asks Tim, that's what you had in mind, right? Before Tim can say anything, Batman asks what she's talking about. And Tim says that he wanted to explore some options about expanding. He didn't think that. Stephanie shouts, are you serious? The colony tried to kill you. And Kate tells him that she can't believe that he would consider something so reckless. Tim yells back, telling them he was considering it if they all agreed to abandon all lethal means. But just then Cassandra shouts, stop, Clayface needs help, need help now. Batman tells everyone, Orphan's right. This discussion can wait. But then, the bat phone lights up. He picks it up telling Jim that they're on the move, but the voice on the other end says that he would like them to listen very carefully. If they are even thinking that they would accept any help from the strike force, they have another thing coming. Batman says, Marakins. And Michael goes on telling him, if you value your relationship with this office, Batman, then you will come to Arkham alone so that we can solve this together. Afterwards, we'll discuss the disbanding of your team and returning of Clayface to Arkham permanently. He slams his fist on the table, yelling that he knows he's going to do whatever the hell he wants. Just know that there will be some damn consequences. Batman hangs up the phone and Tim says that they had to work against City Hall before. If they just go outside and... But Batman tells him, that's enough. We'll break into smaller teams and monitor the victim's day march. And I will go to Arkham alone. A little while later, Batman pulls up to Arkham and as he gets out, he sees Jim and he asks, did you really go along with this? And Jim says, it's about the kids, Batman. I know how you feel about the kids. He goes on explaining the situation that there are 130 Arkham staffers that are being held hostage. They claim that they will start releasing the villain, starting with the most dangerous, until he surrenders. Batman tells him, get your men ready. And Jim asks, what are you planning on doing? Batman walks through the gates asking, isn't it obvious? I'm going to walk through the front door and surrender. Just as Batman gets through the gate, Anarchy tells him, hello. As Anarchy starts leading him to the front door, Batman says, I thought you were better than this. Anarchy tells him, it's a bit more complicated and you know it. 
I've been wanting to fight oppressive systems, and now you created one. You can't see it from the inside, but on the outside, we can see everything. As the front door swings open, the first victim tells Batman, it's been a long time. Batman tells him, I promised that I wouldn't use this unless it was absolutely necessary. I can only use this once every few years if the Joker takes his place over. Batman then calls out, code clearance, Z-E-A, and a computer voice responds, Arkham lockdown procedure activated. All of the doors in the windows begin to lock themselves, and Batman puts up his fist, telling him, let's get on with it. After a long fight, Batman stands back up, fist covered in the red substance the guards wore over their masks. He takes a deep breath and he tells the computer to deactivate it, and then he radios the gym to get ready to move in. The first victim sits up from among the pile of bodies laughing. <laughs> Did you really think that I brought you here to fight? We knew that we couldn't beat you head on! Batman asks, what did you do? And then there's a sudden scream that sounds like Clayface. Just down the hallway, Gloria is thrown from the room and into a wall before falling onto the ground lifeless. Jim storms in with his men, telling everyone to get their hands up now. And Batman tries to tell everyone to get back, but the clay hammer whips out, knocking into several of the guards. And then it starts pulling them back to where Glory was thrown from. A voice then asks, you wanted Clayface the bad guy? Well, you got him. Bruce then says, this is exactly what they wanted. You have to fight through this, Clayface. I know you can. Then there's a clink, clink, and as Batman looks down, he sees Clayface's bracelet. It helps him control his emotions. Bounce on the ground, broken. Clayface asks him, with what? That? I'm sick of feeling bad all the time. Sick of feeling guilty. And Batman tells him, I won't let you do this. And Clayface towers over him, telling him, then you shouldn't have taught me how to fight. At a young age, Basil Carlo was exposed to the bright lights of Hollywood through his father, Vincent Carlo. Back then, Basil would often find himself looking at the old monster costumes that his father wore on the set, amazed at just how real they looked. One night in the stuffy apartment, Vincent pointed to Mardok the Man-Ape, stating that everyone knew the actor Chandler Ebb was the one that was inside of him. But when the lights hit just right and he roared, the audience forgot for a brief moment that someone was underneath that mask. It wasn't the monster that they saw anymore, it was something honest and powerful that hit them right in the heart and terrified them. Vincent then grabs a jar of a substance called Renew, going on stating that a face can be shaped and molded to draw out the strange and the horrific. This here is the key to that success. On the jar, the words, not for human use, can be read, and Vincent tells Basil that once you mix this industrial chemical with a bit of wax and putty, you can rework it. Vincent turns around applying the chemical and when he turns back, his skin is pulled back, revealing a glaring smile and he says that with this, people can see something more real. Vincent begins to wipe the wax off, asking his son to forgive him. He's never really been good at happy faces. He's always been suited for horror. The tone in Vincent's voice turns into one of sadness and he says that there's a monster in all of them. They must work hard to never let anyone see it. You can only show them your best face no matter how false it is because in the end, no one really loves a monster. 20 years later, Basil followed in his father's footsteps in becoming an actor, and a well-known one at that. As Basil and his agent Cal sit for dinner, Cal goes on stating that with their recent success, directors from all over are crawling to them with offers. Basil laughs, telling him that he's not going to be going to any more meetings until he can get in the room for second skin. Cal says sure he could, but that movie is all wrong for him. They just got done with doing so many movies where he looks like the bad guy. Soon people will believe that he's the bad guy. Not to mention, Veronica St. Clair is a real prude and she'll kick anyone off the set for as little as forgetting a line. Basil's phone begins to ring and he reaches forward stating that he wants that role. He wants to be on that movie, Second Skin. Its story is something close to home for him. As he looks at his phone, he says that he's sorry he's got to take it. It's glory. Kyle asks who? The PA from Metamorphosis? He's got to shake her off before she sees what he really is. And that is a movie star, baby. The next morning, Basil meets with Glory to see the sun rise over LA. And she says that it's like you can almost see how beautiful the city is from up here. He stares off, telling her, yeah. And she asks, what's with him today? Why is he so nervous about this next audition? And what's so special about a silent movie monster that is so appealing? He explains that it's about a man who's consumed with sadness and anger, and it burns him and those around him. His dad was a lot like that, and it just feels like something that he needs to do. Show people that you can show the world your dark side and people will still embrace you. Finally, show the world the real you. Later that day after the audition, Basil calls Glory to tell her that he got the part. He nailed it. He's gonna be moving to Gotham for six months for shooting. 
She tells him that's amazing. They need to celebrate and get some drinks. How about she picks up the finest $15 Prosesco in all of the land? Just before Basil can answer, his phone beeps, and he says that he's gonna have to call her back. He needs to take this. He answered it, and a voice asks if it's Basil Carlo. They need to inform him of some bad news. His father was found dead in his apartment. His eyes go wide, and there's a loud screech, and then a crash. A short while later, he opens up his eyes, and when he does, he sees Glory and Cal looking at him horrified. He asks why they're looking at him like that, and Glory says that they're just happy to see him alive. He almost didn't make it, and he tells her, no, Cal's look. Glory hands him a mirror, stating that he's been through a lot, that he both cares so much about him. He looks at his face, now all scarred and deformed, and he quietly says, oh God. He leans down to try and hide, and Glory tells him that it's going to be okay, and he screams, Don't look at me! No one can see me like this! And Cal tells him that that's his cue to leave then. He's not going to sugarcoat things. No one's going to want that face. Once Basil is well enough to leave the hospital, he makes his way to his father's old apartment in search of what his father showed him a long time ago. The jars of Renew. He takes one of those jars and he pours the chemical into a clump of clay, and he begins to apply it to his face. And the next day, at the second skin office, Cal tells Veronica that he has someone else that it would be perfect for the role here. And just then, the door opens and Basil walks in his face completely healed, stating that that won't be necessary. He's looking just as good as ever, right? After the meeting, Glory runs out to see Basil and calls out to him, asking how did he recover so quickly? He tells her to keep her voice down. This is just how he looks. Don't go off talking about something horrible that had happened to him and never bring it up again. Glory turns away, telling him, yeah, that won't be a problem. As he heads home, he notices his supply of Renew is running low, and it looked like the manufacturer was based out of Gotham. Three weeks later in Gotham, Jim Gordon plays a recording to Batman, stating that it was taken from the Quality Assurance Department of Daggett Chemicals. Even though it's a product that's been discontinued, a man called in screaming and demanding that he be given some. The product Renew was a type of gel used to remold plastics without heat. It was taken off of the shelves 20 years ago because it had a bad habit of melting the hands of people. Outside of Daggett Warehouse, Basil begins to put on the wax, changing himself into one of the security guards stationed in the building. He breaks in and finds a whole room full of Renew, and he says that he can finish the movie with this much. And just then, Batman appears telling Basil to step away from the boxes before he gets hurt. He shouts that he doesn't understand, he needs that stuff, and there's nothing that will stop him from getting it. Batman punches Basil on the face, and as he pulls his fist back, he can see what the chemicals have done to his face. And later, as Basil wakes up, he finds himself cuffed to a bed, and he screams to the nurse to give him a mirror. A hand reaches down with one, and he snatches it, and once he sees his face, he tries to hide it, yelling that no one can see him like this. The voice then says, too late for that, and tosses a newspaper with the headline, acclaimed actor turned into clay-faced crook. As he looks up, he sees the person talking to him is Veronica, and she tells him that, you know, she would have casted him regardless of what happened to him. It wasn't his looks that they were after, it was his eye. That dark sadness that needed to be seen. Then, he could show the world who he was. But now, with all this fake acting, he isn't going to be a part of the movie anymore. As she turns to leave, Basil looks in the mirror again and he hears a loud, roaring thunder. Lightning strikes and as he looks up, he sees Batman standing there and he tells him, Basil Carlo, you have a choice to make. Basil shouts, a choice? I'm a monster! I used to be an actor! I was going to be one of the greats, but you cost me everything! Batman tells him, no, you're not a monster. You're a man lashing out because you feel trapped and alone. Daggett isn't going to be pressing charges because technically they shouldn't even be having this stuff, but in the morning, we're gonna go see Harvey Dent. The next morning, Basil heads over to the DA's office to speak to Harvey, and as soon as he gets in, he grabs a woman and presses a gun to her head, shouting, where is it? The two nearby guards pull out their guns, and one tells him that Renew is in evidence room six. Basil takes the woman running into the room, and the first guard whispers to the other one that he heard that Mr. Daggett is offering a big payout to keep this whole thing quiet. He doesn't want people knowing that he still had the stuff, so if they can silence Carlo, there's a big payday for both of them. Inside of the evidence room, Basil pushes the woman away, looking at the jars, stating, Yes, yes! But before he could grab a jar, the guards open fire, hitting the jars, covering Basil's entire body in the chemical. The guards state that it looks like he won't be stating anything to anyone now, and then there's a low, scruffy voice asking for a mirror. Over on the set of Veronica's movie, Cal welcomes the new replacement actor, and Glory tells her that they themselves have a visitor today. As they look back, they see Batman, and he tells everyone, You need to run! Now! Loud thooms can be heard in the distance, as Basil breaks through the walls, telling Batman, I made my choice! Basil swings an arm, knocking Batman away, and instead of running, Glory runs up, telling Basil that she doesn't know what happened, but she knows that he's not really a monster! Basil pulls out a jar of Renew, asking, Don't you get it? There's a monster inside of all of us. Let me show you. And then he pours it 
on to glory, and in doing so he broke a promise. Long ago, while sitting with his father, watching another horror movie, the woman on the TV shouts, Get back, you hideous beast. Vincent turned to his son, stating that he wanted him to promise him something. No matter what, he wouldn't let anyone see the monster inside. And Basil looks back at his father, telling him, Yeah, I promise. Now it's time for the continuation of the fall of the Batman story. Now that you have seen where Basil Carlo came from and how he became Clayface, it's time to see what he's going to do now that he is no longer working with Batman but against him. Recently, the band that was allowing him to keep control of himself was broken off by the victim syndicate, and as Batman went in to save Clayface, he was forced to fight Clayface, who he has now trained to fight. As Clayface steps forward, he goes on telling him, I'm gonna take a guess that you're probably going to say that this isn't me, right? That this monster really isn't who I am. Well, I have news for you. That's all wrong. It's been wrong since the beginning, Batman. Clayface then takes a swing, grabbing a hold of Batman, telling him, I'm just a freaking bad guy. I hurt people and I don't care. Batman struggles, telling him, yes, you do. And Clayface throws him, shouting, shut up. Batman's body is thrown into the storage room containing all of the villain's weaponry, and he gets up stating, all you're doing is lashing out. Let us help you. And Clayface shouts, telling him, shut up. As Clayface pulls back to hit Batman, Batman grabs Mr. Freeze's freeze gun, freezing him in place. Batman then drops the gun, telling Clayface that they will help him. He promised him that months ago. But then Batman stops and switches his mask to thermal mode. Kate radios in, asking if he's got Basil yet. And Batman smashes the ice, yelling, No, damn it, he made a husk of himself. He's gone through the sewers. He's headed for the Belfry. As Batman begins to walk back out of the Arkham Gates, Mayor Atkins says that the first victim in anarchy escaped. The people in the streets are rioting. He knew that this would. But Batman stops him, telling him, I spend most of my career operating in direct defiance of your office. I recognize what's about to happen, and I'm going to make it right. He continues walking towards the Batmobile, and Mayor Atkins tells him, Clayface belongs in this asylum. He's a monster. Batman jumps into the car and says, So am I. Now stay out of my way. Elsewhere, the first victim in Anarchy watches as the protests get larger in size, and Anarchy says that it is finally happening. The people are taking back the power. The first victim tells him that this is good. He wants to be there when it happens. He wants to see the bats die. Anarchy pauses and tells him, the people would be better served with our presence. They are frightened, and now is the moment that we can light the fire of the revolution. The first victim tells him, I don't care about tomorrow. Today is what I've been waiting for for years. I want to hear Batman scream as he loses everything. Out in the streets, Kate is watching over everything, and Jacob's voice tells her, thanks for coming. I know this is an all-hands-on-deck situation. And Kate tells him, make it fast. Batman has coverage on the Belfry. We need to stop Clayface before he hurts anyone else. Jacob sets down the briefcase, telling her, this will only take a moment. I wanted to give this as a good sign of faith. Kate opens up the case and sees a gun, and Jacob explains that this is one of the last weapons that Ulysses developed. It was for the colony to defend against Clayface. It starts a chain reaction that destabilizes his molecular structure so that it can't adhere to itself. This is the only rifle ever constructed. And Kate says that it would kill Clayface. Why would he give this to her? He knows that Batman would never allow killing of any of his villains, let alone an ally. Jacob hands the case over, telling her, Maybe we can break it apart and make it not lethal. This is not my territory, but if it becomes necessary, I wanted you to have it. She takes the case and begins to walk away, telling him, Thanks. Later, as she returns to the Belfry, Tim looks at her, asking where she's been. They've radioed, but Kate stops him, telling him that she was on reconnaissance. Tim then runs over, shouting that she's lying. But Batman separates them, stating that whatever this thing is between them, he's had enough of it. Just then, from the bell, Clayface appears, telling them, So have I. As he grows larger, Clayface swings, knocking Tim away, and then he creates spikes, swinging it back towards him. Kate tries to distract them by throwing batterings, but Clayface swings back, hitting her, telling her that she knows that he's going to kill her, right? You already got the flash forward. He then creates an image of future Tim, stating, Maybe we can make a reenactment. Batman then runs in, kicking a hole through Clayface, telling him, Stop! And Clayface creates an image of past villains, asking, Who are you gonna sign up on the Bat Team thing next, huh? He then creates another spiked ball, hurling it at Batman, shouting, Ah, oh, you don't care about any of them! Cassandra steps in front of them, telling him, Not true. And Clayface tells her, Get out of the way! And she says, No. If don't care, hurt me. Clayface begins growing before her, yelling, I will! And Cassandra tells him, Do it! Clayface begins to tremble, and then he falls to the ground, stating, He doesn't want to. What is he doing? Why is he hurting her? Suddenly, an alert goes off, and Tim says that there's been damage to the mudroom. It's about to expel all of the excess clay that they've been using for training. Kate asks, what are they talking about? There's hundreds and hundreds of gallons of it in there. And just then, as Clayface looks up, he sees the excess clay beginning to drip onto him. He yells that he doesn't want. He can't think! 
RUN! And as the clay starts to pour out, the Belfry Tower begins to explode it with clay. Clayface pulls himself out of the top of the tower, screaming. He continues growing at an alarming rate, destroying the rest of the Belfry in his wake. And through the debris, Tim is knocked and thrown aside. Kate swings by, quickly grabbing him, falling onto a nearby roof. Everyone else begins to arrive, and Stephanie swings down, asking what the hell happened. Batman follows up, stating that the excess clay in the mud room is what happened. Once he lands, he tells Stephanie and Cassandra to head over to Monster Town. They need Dr. October working on it. And right now, now I'm gonna lead Clayface there. Before leaving, he looks back at Kate and he tells her, I'm gonna need you above all of the action. Keep me pointed to Monster Town. Down on the streets, the people hold their protests as they feel the rumbling in the ground. Clayface pulls himself out, roaring at the crowds. He begins to reach for them, but as he does, several missiles hit him in the back of the head. Batman shouts that he doesn't want them. You wanted to fight me, right? Clayface turns back, trying to hit Batman in the Batmobile, but Batman speeds off, having Clayface chase him. Watching all of the chaos from above, the first victim asks Anarchy if he can hear it. The music that is playing for us. Anarchy says that he hears the people terrified out of their minds. When he first came here, he wanted to help them. And the first victim tells him, We are helping. Batman put the weapon into my hand and I'm merely pulling the trigger. Anarchy points at him, telling him, These people trusted you. They believed in your message. And as the staff bounce off the reflective barrier, Anarchy tells him, Yeah, well, I'm an idealist. Back in the streets, Luke sends out all of the bat drones to keep focus on Batman, and as Clayface lashes out, he destroys several of the robots in one swing. Over in Victoria's lab, Tim starts getting up from the bed asking what happened, and Stephanie tries to lay him down, telling him that he has a concussion, but he's fine now. Tim continues to try and get up, stating, but the victim's day rallies. Suddenly, a voice tells them that they are dispersing. He sent a signal throughout the Syndicate's network. The first victim wanted to make them martyrs. Tim and Stephanie look over to see Anarchy throwing the first victim's body to the ground, and he finishes up stating that he couldn't live with the kind of blood on his hands. Stephanie runs over hugging him and he tells her that she's not going to see him for a while. Is she sure she's where she wants to be? Stephanie says that she's where she needs to be. That's what matters for now. Anarchy hands over a small jump drive stating that she's going to have to give this to Batman. It might give him enough to start putting together who exactly the first victim is. Back outside, Kate keeps watch over the street, stating that this isn't going to work. She opens up the case that her father gave her, telling Batman that they may need to discuss a permanent solution for Clayface. If Victoria's cure works, they might be able to neutralize him. But Jacob has also given her a special kind of gun. Batman says, I will not allow any colony weapons to be fired in this city. We stick to the plan. Kate asks what happens when the plan fails, and Bruce tells her, We need to clear the line. I've led Clayface too. Just then, his eyes widen as Clayface begins to grow around the streets, roaring as his mouth fully forms. As the Batmobile is tossed away, Cassandra jumps down onto Clayface's back, and she runs up, slamming a syringe into him. He howls in pain, and then he begins to shriek, growing smaller, until he's finally Basil Carlo. He's finally human. He falls to his knees, looking around, asking what's going on. Did he do all of this? Is it over? And Cassandra says, No, you'll turn back. Too, too much clay. Clayface sulks, stating, of course, it'd be too easy for him to just be good, wouldn't it? He can't do it! Cassandra leans down, telling him, You are good. I know you. I see you. I like you! Clayface looks up, stating that bad guys don't get happy endings. And just then, his skin begins to change back and he tries to keep himself together. Suddenly, Cassandra hears a voice from the radio, and Kate tells her to close her eyes. Before Cassandra has a chance to understand what she meant, the bullet is shot, hitting Clayface in the side of the head, ending him. Now, many years ago in the Gotham City graveyard, the first shovel of dirt was thrown on the late Mrs. Kane. As each person takes their turn, the young Bruce Wayne tosses his dirt in and then he looks back at the young Kate Kane. While Alfred and Kate's father Jacob talk, Kate glances at Bruce and tells him that he's lurking again. Bruce sighs and says that he's sorry he does that, but Kate tells him it's okay. It helps keep everyone away. A few moments pass and Bruce takes out his umbrella and Kate asks, does it ever stop hurting? Bruce pauses and tries to come up with an answer, but he tells her no. It might be different if it was a disease, but you never stop hurting. Soon everyone begins to leave the graveyard and Kate says that the only time that she feels anything is when she thinks about finding those men and hurting them. Make them afraid like how she was. But she also knows that that's not very healthy. Bruce holds out his hand like he's holding a gun. And he tells Kate that he has dreams, really messed up dreams. Dreams where he finds the man who did this and he shoots them like he shot his parents. Those are the good dreams. Kate then asks, why don't you? Why don't you find them and kill them? 
Back in the current time, Kate wakes up from her dream staring at the ceiling. However, the only thing that really keeps her up was that look in Cassandra's eyes. After a few moments of dwelling, Kate's phone rings, and as she picks it up, a voice tells her that today's the day. Over at the Bat Cave, Bruce calls upon the Bat family, consisting of Dick Grayson, Jason Todd, Barbara Gordon, Tim Drake, and Damian Wayne. He tells them that they are here today because he trusts their judgment. He wants and needs to know what they think before he takes action against Kate. They need to decide what to do. A short while later, everyone sits at the table and silence fills the room. Tim looks around and says, okay, we'll start. Before he can say his part, just know that he comes from a slightly different place than the rest of them. Tragedy didn't really have a part in him putting on his costume. He joined because he believed in Batman and Robin. He believed that they meant something to this city. It made them better because of it. Often he would sit at home and dream about sitting at a table just like this, throwing out ideas about how to make Gotham better with Batman. He then takes out a small journal and he sets it down and he says that he wrote all of those ideas down. Each and every crazy unrealistic idea, how to make Batman eternal. What Batwoman did, didn't make them better, it was cynical. It came from believing that the worst is inevitable. I, for one, can't think that way. The Bat symbol needs to mean something better than that, something more. After a few minutes, Dick says, wow, okay, guess I'll go. I, for one, don't like to judge people. I like to see the best in people. I believe Kate did what she did because she believed it was the only possible answer to that situation. I also wasn't around much to see the kind of person that Clayface had become. It's nice knowing that that door to redemption was opened for him, but now all I can think about is what would have happened if I had pulled the trigger. Sure, I wouldn't be sitting at this table without some serious atonement, but there is a path to earn back everyone's trust. But Kate's not there yet. I'm not so sure she should wear the bat in the meantime on her atonement. Next, Jason takes off his mask and he sets it down telling him, all right, it's my turn. You're all probably expecting me to side with her. And you're right, but right for the wrong reason. I, for one, am not stupid enough to make a sincere argument for killing people who deserve it in the Bat Cave. I have enough respect for this place, but this trial, it's not about her killing Clayface. It's about how she hurt his ego. Batman is throwing a tantrum because somebody he respects broke the rules. Family is family. My vote is for her to stay. If you need to make room at the table for black sheeps, I can do that. After a few moments, Bruce looks at Barbara and says that she's rather quiet. Barbara says, yes, she is. So let her start by asking a question. What's the purpose of the Belfry? For those of you who may be just joining us, the Belfry is the organization that was started by Batman and Tim as a way to have more oversight in the city of Gotham. It's what's been going on in the entire Detective Comics run. The link to the playlist is down below. Tim begins to explain, but Barbara stops him stating that she needs him to believe her when she says that she's not trying to offend him. She needs an answer, not from an idealistic teenager. Bruce asks, where are you going with this? And Barbara tells him, we're gonna find out together. You had evidence that a paramilitary group called the Colony was looking to recruit Gotham's unaffiliated heroes, specifically Batwoman. Bruce tells her, yeah. And Barbara goes on telling him, right, so you needed a way to beat them to the punch. So you let a protege, Tim Drake, who had been pushing for years to let something like this happen. Someone that you could throw enough money at to have something built up. Bruce asks, Barbara, what is it that you're trying to say? And Barbara tells him, you know exactly what I'm asking. Bruce tells her outright, clarify, lay it out for me. Barbara says, you didn't form this team because you believed in Tim's utopia. It's because you wanted to steer your cousin, Batwoman, away from the path that she started when her mother was killed. You didn't want her to become a soldier. You wanted her to become a bat. If you thought using Tim's plan, you could make that happen. Tim looks at Bruce looking for an answer and Bruce doesn't respond to him. Barbara goes on stating, but Bruce, you wanted her to believe your way as much as you do yourself. That's why you threw caution to the wind and built an unstable system that is always going to fall apart. Tim stands up shouting, the nice program can work. And Barbara slams her fist down asking, what about Cassandra then? She was tortured to the edge of sanity by her father, incapable of regular speech, living in an attic in a rundown theater with no adult supervision. The most human connection that she made was with a super villain that she's been punching since she had pimples. Bruce tells her that is enough. I would never deliberately do anything to hurt Cassandra. Why would you even think? Barbara stops him, telling him, this part is just theory, but it's probably a good one. In fact, it might even be the reason why you called us all here. It's because you don't know the answer. And we all know you better than you know yourself. You're doing this because Kate is the closing living connection to your mother, Martha. You're afraid that Martha would have wanted you to take that shot, which now throws more into question whether Kate should wear the bat. The fact is, Kate is the only person who can take the bat away. 
So if we're gonna make a case about Kate being out of control or dangerous and someone who needs to be stopped, then it better be a good case. Then and only then will I fight alongside you and take her down. Until then, Jason's right. Although not as right as he thinks. This isn't about her, it's about you, Bruce. The only person who can put Kate Kane on trial is Kate Kane. And from what I've heard about her, that's probably exactly what she's putting herself through right now. Meanwhile, over at the graveyard. Kate stands in front of the grave of her mother stating that she's not very good at this sort of thing. She knows that she doesn't do it as often as she should. But she made a decision last week that could potentially blow up in her face. Not that she's not used to it, but this one feels different. She killed a man. She can't say that he was a good man, but he was trying to do good. She did it to save a girl. What's been haunting her isn't that she killed a man, but it was the look in the girl's eyes. It was the look that she has seen before. They were the eyes of someone who just broke. It was the same eyes of a girl who saw her own reflection in the shovel before throwing dirt onto her mother's grave. The only thing that helped was thinking that becoming something that would stop what happened from happening to someone else. Maybe she stepped off, maybe she went down the wrong path, but it's time to get back to who she really is. The mission that started here. She turns and she walks away. And a man in the shadows tells her that it's good of her to come on the anniversary. Kate stops him stating that he should go talk to her. And the man says that he probably should. Kate takes off her sunglasses, telling her father, Jacob, that she's been thinking about his offer to join the paramilitary group, Colony. His offer to come and run Colony, the group that works against Batman, to do it right. Jacob asks her, and Kate tells him, she's in, let's do this. As Cassandra sits down in her room, she speaks of a time several weeks ago when she had a run-in with a group of children traffickers. Just as the leader was preparing to send out the next group of kids, he noticed something in the shadows and he said that it would seem that they aren't alone. Cassandra stepped out of the darkness telling him, no, you're not. The children, you won't. Take them. The leader begins to laugh as electricity is shot out of his tattoos and he calls out to his men to deal with the child. As they rush in, Cassandra easily disarms them, knocking them out one by one, leaving the leader last. He clenches his fist, asking, Do you understand yet? My tattoos are laced with microscopic electrodes. Every strike carries an electric death. The leader swings, and as Cassandra dodges, she tells him, Then hit me. After missing and falling on the ground, the leader pulls back one last time to hit before being punched to the ground by Clayface. He asks, Did I smash the right guy? And Cassandra tells him yes, but more Yakuza. Clayface readies himself for a fight, stating, Good! I was afraid I was missing the fun part. In our current time, Leslie Tompkins asks, so that's the last time she remembers being happy? Hunting those men was a good thing? Cassandra says, to be good, need to go. Good things. They stole children. We saved them. It was good. Leslie then asks, do you think that you're a good person? And Cassandra tells her, I don't think. I know I'm not good. I can do things but I'm not good. Leslie begins writing in her notepad and she asks, what about her friend Clayface? Cassandra pauses and looks away stating, he tried, but they still killed him. Maybe one day they'll kill me too. And as those words leave her lips, Bruce watches from the bat cave holding his head in his hands. Later as Leslie gets ready to leave, Bruce asks if she has a moment and Leslie tells him, look, I can hate what you did to the boy all I want but you at least spent time with them, each of the Robins. You helped them work through their demons. However, Cassandra doesn't have the tools to deal with them, and frankly, I'm not sure that I do either. All I can say for now is that if you insist on dragging Cassandra deeper into this world, you're going to hurt her. Later that night at sea, a freight ship is hijacked by a group of men from the Court of the Owls, and just before they can kill the captain, there's an explosion. From the blast, Kate Kane stands there with Batwing and Azrael, telling the men, no one is dying today, but you can hurt the zombie owl ninjas real good. While those three bring down the Court of the Owl men, Tim makes his way into the Batcave to find Bruce still working on the computer. He says that he would have thought he would have already been out of patrol, and Bruce tells him that he already has Batgirl giving the city a sweep. He could be in Midtown in less than four minutes if needed, but there is something much more pressing here at home. It looks like somebody's been using the Bat computer for hours every night for the past few weeks while he was out of the cave. Let's see what they've been building. The projection table buzzes, bringing up an image of a Bat Tower in the middle of Gotham, and Tim tells him, Hold on, give me a minute to explain there. Bruce tells Tim that he suffered a major concussion in the King Clayface attack. He was supposed to be recovering. And Tim yells, Batgirl destroyed everything that we built over the last year just the other day. You had to realize that it would start solving every hole that she punched into the night program. 
You probably even expected it. Bruce looks at the table, telling him that he's not interested in starting up the Knight's Protocol again. He'll continue to provide assistance to the family as needed. Tim shouts, you can't be serious! You can't let a little wrench in the works of the machine blow it all up! Batgirl wasn't right! Bruce takes a deep breath and he says, Batgirl is right. And you know it. You've trained for years to see that. Instead, all you're hearing is the voice of desperation. Echoes of Mr. Oz's prison. I shouldn't have let you back into action so soon. I should have gotten you help. Tim yells, this isn't some teenage tantrum. This is the future of everything that we talked about. The entire future of Batman. I don't care what happens to. Bruce spins him around shouting, well, I do care, damn it. This conversation's over. Leslie Tompkins is coming back tomorrow for a session with Cassandra. Afterwards, you should talk to her. Tim hops over the rails to his bike stand. Yeah, well, screw it. I'm starting to remember why I spent so much time away from Gotham. But as Tim speeds off to the Belfry, he punches the wall screaming in frustration and then suddenly a voice calls out. The voice calls, stating that he knows exactly how he feels. He had it right in his grasp. He's the only one smart enough to see the pieces moving. Tim turns back, asking who was there, and the voice gets louder and says, Sorry, I keep forgetting we're not friends. Yet. I've been studying the work that you've done, the work that you're going to do. And Tim asks, How could you possibly know? And Ulysses steps out, stating, I know all about Bat Tim from the future because I've seen it. We met before, but right now this device in my hand, it has the entire history of the future stolen right from the central computer of your future self. So, you want to take a look? Moments later, Tim begins to see himself in the future attending Ivy University, living a peaceful life. But that life is taken away when the news reports that the President of the United States deploys the colony to take Batman in. Tim watches the TV as it shows Kate moving in on Wayne Manor with colony forces and her gunning Bruce down. Back in the current time, Tim watches all of the images of the future and Ulysses says, pretty gruesome, huh? Tim tells him that he doesn't understand what the hell did I just witness. And Ulysses says that you saw the future, your future, how you become an evil deranged Batman. We don't have all the details, but the important beats still hit, don't they? Ulysses turns to leave and Tim asks, why would you show me this? And Ulysses tells him, you already know why. So I can help you, Tim. Tim begins to follow Ulysses into the next room, filled with rare historical weapons. And that's when Tim asks, what is all of this? Ulysses says, well, I wasn't working for the colony for chump change. Weapons development is a lucrative business. It allowed me to acquire some ingenious weapons, some of the best ones ever designed. And not just the finished projects, but the prototypes. The ones that you can feel the heart put into them. Tim says, please don't take this the wrong way, but this is a lot to process. I still can't figure out what's in it for you. Ulysses tells him that a few weeks ago, he cracked the files and saw the history of the future and wasn't in it. Another version of him went head to head with Batman, but mostly he just fell off the face of the earth. He couldn't let that happen. He had a much higher role in shaping the future. And that's when he learned that role. The role for him was to give Tim Drake the future today. Brother I, activate full systems and say hello to your creator. I'll give you the tools that you used to create a lasting piece of Gotham before you were hit with all that trauma that messed up your future self. What do you say? Tim takes a moment and tells him that he needs to think about it. And Ulysses shouts, really? You're seriously not going to jump on this? Well, I'm not going to pretend I'm not disappointed, but I understand. Don't take too long, okay? There is a reason for all this. Batwoman just officially signed up with the colony along with her friends, Batwing and Azrael. Eternity is marching forward and you need to shape it before it shapes you. A short while later, out on the rooftops, Bruce watches a group of criminals conducting business, and Tim looks over, stating that he's going to take a guess that they're talking about puppies. Bruce tells him that he isn't going to reconsider the bell, for he's not restarting Gotham Knights. And Tim jumps down, telling him that he knows. He just wanted to say that he saw something today that really shook him. He just wanted to be by Batman's side. He knows he's been off lately, so that's why he's here, asking for help. Bruce tells him that he can start by taking out the two smaller guys on the right, while he takes out the one with the semi-automatic. Tim asks seriously, and Bruce smiles, telling him, I'm glad you came back. Tim laughs, telling him, <laughs> me too. But just before the two of them can jump into action, the two colony men wearing battle suits jump into the bar and immediately open fire on everyone. Meanwhile, back with Ulysses, he watches the video feed of the colony soldier stating that this is all for you, Tim. I just need you to see what I have to offer. Later in the bat cave, Bruce looks down at the two men wearing the battle suits and Tim tells him 18 mobsters are dead, yet he still brought them back to the cave. This is really a dangerous idea. And Bruce says that he knows. Tim goes on stating that the aggressive lethal force being used by the colony is their MO. And after this, you want to sit down and talk to them face to face? Last time, Colonel Kane kidnapped you and got a gun to your head just to get you out of the way. Bruce bends down, looking at the men stating that he needs to be a detective here. They have a mystery at their feet. 
the fractures that these men suffered. It's as if they were fighting against the suits. They've always known that the colony had battle suits with independent programming. And Tim says, okay, fine, so that's a mystery, but we need to stay here and figure out the answer together. Bruce walks and jumps into the Batmobile, telling him that he wants him to run every diagnostic that he could think of on their suits, keep them unconscious. Tim tells him that he doesn't like it, and Bruce says that he doesn't either. The other half of this mystery isn't in this cave, and he plans to find it. While he leaves the Batcave, Ulysses tells Brother Eye to access the tracker protocol and keep an eye on Batman. He watches as Bruce makes his way to Kane Manor, and Ulysses asks, what's this, the childhood home of Nathan, Philip, Jacob, and Martha Kane? Scan for buyer signatures. Brother Eye runs a scan, and on the screen, images of Kate and Jacob appear, and Ulysses takes another bite out of his takeout, stating, ah, this is gonna be a nice family reunion. Bruce walks up around the rundown manor, looking at all of the photos of the Canes, and Kate and Jacob step out of the shadows, stating that they're glad that he can make it. But let's be clear, they had nothing to do with the soldiers. Someone is trying to pit them against one another. Bruce picks up a picture from the frame, asking, who could it be? And Kate tells him that she isn't taking the bait. They're all here, aren't they? She agrees that the trust needs to be earned, so let her start earning it. Back in the cave, Tim runs the scans on the colony soldiers, not finding anything out of the ordinary, and then out of the shadows, Cassandra jumps down asking, where are you going? Tim jumps back in panic and then laughs, asking, how did you get in here? I thought he locked every entrance. Cassandra looks over at the soldiers, stating, bad men. And when she touches the battlesuit's helmets, she says, Batwoman. Tim asks if everything's okay, and Cassandra says, all this, everything we go, is it good? Tim begins stating, well, I think we do our best to be good, but sometimes we make mistakes. And Cassandra stops, like Clayface. Tim pauses and then says, well, I've been meaning to ask. Could you maybe use a new scene partner? I know you were working on The Tempest, but Midsummer Night's Dream was, but before he could finish, he realizes something. The transformation, that's what didn't make sense. Tim runs back to the computer stating, their bodies weren't networked into the colony suits. They were relying on a different network altogether. He then yells at the computer to run a blood toxicity report, primary focus looking for traces of nanotech. Just then the entire system lights up red and Tim says, he's gonna kill them. He's gonna kill all of them. Meanwhile, back with Ulysses, he watches as Tim begins to connect the dots and he grabs an electric razor stating, <laughs> it's just so sad. He was supposed to be a supporting role, but we're on the verge of the impossible. We're crashing an entire future down onto the present. Ulysses then tells Brother I to activate full systems, take full control. And Brother I responds, I comply. Ulysses begins to shave off parts of his hair, stating that it's time to be what the future demands. And on the mini screen in front of him, all of the colony battle suits begin to activate. Back at Kane Manor, Bruce folds his arms, stating that if what they're saying is true, then their system is compromised. And Jacob tells him, yeah, we recognize that, which is why we have Lucas Fox investigating the colony airship servers so it doesn't happen again. But while the three of them are talking, the computer screen lights up as it sounds off an alarm. And Kate shouts that they need to get out. They're under attack. Over in the Batcave, Tim frantically comes through the file, stating that this is all Ulysses. He's running one of Brother Eye's systems through his nanovirus, a protocol called One Man Army Corps, OMAC. We need to get those nanobots out of the soldier's bloodstream before it's too late. But as he presses the computer activate button, the screen then lights up, stating access denied. And Ulysses appears on the screen, stating, you had your chance to bring the real lasting order. Now the OMAX will be the foot soldiers of a new tomorrow. And their first job will be to erase anyone stupid enough to stand in their way. Tim yells that this is insane, and Ulysses tells him, don't be so small-minded. Anyway, there's still a role in this for you. Cassandra looks back, asking, Tim? And when she looks, she sees Ulysses' nanobots taking over Tim's body. He shouts, tonight is the beginning of a new, bold era of Batman. And I'm honored for you to be a part of it, Tim. As his vision begins to fade, he begins to return with images of the future of all of his friends. Images of Cassandra dying in a fight looking for answers, Jean-Paul having the mantle of Azriel being taken by force by genetic copies, and the assassination of Luke Fox. Tim yells to stop. He doesn't want to see any of this, but Ulysses tells him that he can't. This is too important. A digital Ulysses then walks out, and Tim shouts that he's done with these games. Ulysses tells him that they aren't done until he says they're done. He probably should have guessed it by now, but there's no way that he can punch his way out of this. But don't worry, your body's about to get one hell of a workout. Back in the Batcave, Cassandra tries hitting Tim to wake him up, and as she kicks Tim one last time, the two soldiers from before grab a hold of her. Tim watches from inside the digital world, shouting to get their hands off of her, and Ulysses laughs, telling him, Oh, come on, get with the program, Timbo, they can't hear you. This is exactly what I was offering you. You want to protect Cassandra? You want to save them all? You can assimilate them into the OMAC project. They can all be a part of our big dream. All I need is for you to give in. What do you say? 
Over in Kane Manor, the Omax begin to storm the ruins, forcing Bruce and Kate into a corner. As everyone begins to get surrounded, Batwing and Azrael jump through the window, and as soon as Batwing lands, he lets out a sonic screech. The soldiers all around begin to fall to the ground, and he says Azrael and him have been fighting these for a bit. The one thing that they've learned is that these are nanobot shells. They can disrupt the communications between the individual parts, and that's when they'll lose control. However, that's not the real bad news. This is future tech, a few decades ahead of our time. This is Brother Eye, the same computer system that we faced when Future Tim came into the picture. Bruce looks at him asking, you think Future Tim is behind this? And Batwing tells him, no, we need to accept that there is a much worse possibility though. Bruce stares for a moment and then he tells him, I'm listening. Tim watches the video from Kane Manor and he screams, it's not me! And Ulysses tells him, of course it's not, but all of these are plays from your playbook. Even Batman is beginning to accept that he may have lost you forever. You've been far too unstable in these past few months to not even admit that it's a possibility. But how about we cut to the chase? I wanted us to be equals in this adventure, but it's clear that you're the wrong Tim for this. Thankfully, I don't need you to agree if you don't want to. Tim turns back shouting, get out of my head! And he punches Ulysses. Ulysses laughs as his body crumbles to pieces and reforms, telling him, it's pathetic, really. Just sit back and let me do all the work. I've never had to save a life before, no lie. I'm pretty excited. He reaches out grabbing Tim by the head and suddenly Tim cries out in pain. Tim tries to pull Ulysses' hands off, but Ulysses presses them together harder and harder, telling him that it's time to be who you are meant to be. Back in the Batcave, Cassandra reaches out for Tim asking, are you in there? Through Brother Eye's voice, Tim hits her with an electrical blast telling her, yes, I finally am. Soon all of the nanobots begin to shine with red lights and they all begin to state, new protocol receiving, processing, run project, Pax Batmana. Tim's nanobots begin to take form of himself as future Batman, including giving him a single brother eye in the middle of his face. Cassandra calls to the computer, calling out to Bruce, but Tim tells her that it won't be necessary. He'll be here soon enough. Cassandra looks back, telling him, no, you're not. And Tim tells her, I know you can read body language. You know this isn't a joke. This is the real me. But there is something I would like you to tell Batman. Something very important. Tell him that I am doing this all for him. So don't get in the way. With that, Tim and the other nanobots shoot up into the sky, breaking out of the Batcave, calling out to the other nanobots. And a few moments later, Bruce runs into the Batcave, calling out to Cassandra, pulling debris off of her, asking if she's all right. Cassandra tells him, Tim, he changed. And Bruce says, I know, but it's okay now. We're gonna get him back. But first, we need to help with the person that you've been sneaking out and keeping track of. A short while later, in the apartment downtown, Bruce and Cassandra look around the messy place, and a female voice tells them, Tim would often talk about how you would randomly show up. No matter how angry he would get, he'd always put on the costume and run out fighting. But tell me, how bad is it? Bruce looks right at her, telling her, Spoiler, it's time. We need your help. Stephanie sighs, sipping her soda. Fine. Let's get to work. Back with the nanobots, they begin to gather around the old rundown building, joining together to reconstruct the building into a newer, better version of the Belfry. The Belfry 2.0, and Ulysses says, This is it. This is Batman. And Tim tells him, Yes, this is exactly where I need to be. Belfry 2.0 is online. Let's get to work. A few moments later, Tim begins his raid on the GCPD to acquire more soldiers for his task force. As the nanobots swarm throughout the building, Tim walks behind them, shooting people, telling them, don't consider these bullets an execution, but as a sign of respect, we will make you a part of the OMAC project and pave the way for a brighter future. Just as Tim points his gun at Detective Montoya, Kate bursts in, kicking Tim to the ground, telling him that he better not lay a finger on her. That's right, Tim, brother I, whatever you're called now, it's me, the big bad woman who nearly destroys your perfect pacifist Gotham all over again. Tim gets back up asking, what is the advantage you think you have by confronting me like this? Ulysses radios in stating, this is totally your call. I know you're gonna try and save the Bat family, but this one, she's something else. Kate turns to run out and Tim tells the nanobots to set their priority to eliminating Batwoman. Kate jumps down from the building, calling out that she's got them on her tail and they are very excited to try and kill her. So please say your part of the plan is going smooth. Bruce tells her that he, Cassandra, and Stephanie are sneaking into the new Belfry now. Stephanie's drones are keeping them invisible to Brother Eye's detection. Stephanie says, yeah, they're not visible to anything using Tim's base coat, which is to say every inch of the damn tower. But he didn't really think that this was going to work, right? It was stupid of her to think that she could ever be a part of the Bat family. Cassandra calls back, I believe you. And Stephanie tells her that's why she likes her way better than Mr. Broods a lot. The three of them continue to climb the tower, but Stephanie stops them stating that there's been a problem. There's too much information static ahead, which means the drones won't be able to cover them. Bruce tells her that we just have to act fast. 
Everyone drops down into the server room, but as Stephanie looks at everything, she says that this is insane. These boxes are processing hundreds of Yado bytes of data. This place, it could power the entire internet if it spanned the solar system. Over in the control room, Ulysses' computer sound off with an alarm and he asks, how the hell did they get in? He then radios to Tim telling him, hey, you're deadbeat dad, you showed up to ruin the party. Back out in the city, Tim catches up to Kate telling her, it is pointless to run. We have seen the future in which you bring, you must be stunned. Kate stops turning back asking, is that so? And then she attempts to fight back. As Tim blocks her attacks, he tells her, This is Omac nano shells coating my body, and they can absorb every hit that you throw, and then turn it back into kinetic energy at you. He knocks her to the ground, and he holds his hand over her face, telling her, I'm gonna show you what happens. I'm going to show you what your legacy brings. Over at the tower, Stephanie begins to work through the computer, stating that this is something else. The coding is from the future of alternate timelines. It's leaps and bounds with what she's familiar with. But it's still Tim's work. She can already see all of his quirks line by line. So if she does it right, she might be able to turn off the connection between him and Brother Eye. Just then the server room lights up turning red and Brother Eye tells her, that is unlikely. Bruce tells Cassandra to make sure that she keeps Stephanie safe at all costs. And Brother Eye goes on telling Bruce, you were an inadequate father. You refused to utilize me to the extent that I could have been used. Tim has been given the control that he needed and now we will do the same. Nanobot covered Batwing and Azrael step out and they begin to attack. Stephanie turns back to continue work on the computer, but Brother I tells her that you will never fully realize what this timeline has taken away from you. Stephanie pauses asking, what do you mean? Images begin to form in front of her, showing her as the future Batgirl, along with Cassandra at her side. Back out on the city, Kate's vision begins to change, and she soon finds herself in Wayne Manor. She looks around asking, how is she here? And then suddenly, colony soldiers begin running up. That's when she sees what Tim wanted her to see, the future of her giving orders to those soldiers to blow up the grandfather clock. As the soldiers get to work, Tim asks, do you see why I needed you to understand? This is what happens if you're allowed to continue down this path. This is why you need to die. Over in the server room, Cassandra takes off her mask, asking, it's us. Batgirls? And Brother Eye tells her, Yes, you were accepted to be a part of their world. Cassandra Kane was no orphan. She was family. Stephanie Brown, your journey with the Bat only began a spoiler, but you would later become the next Robin. Now do you understand why they do not see you as a threat? Those versions are your better selves. You are not that. You are second rate. You will never measure up. Stephanie begins to cry, and then she stops and begins to laugh. Brother I says, I do not understand, are you laughing? And as Stephanie hugs Cassandra, she taps the button on her wrist stating, I'm doing more than that. Just then Brother I begins to say, ever, ever. And Ulysses asks, what the hell did she just do? Stephanie calls out that they wanted to hurt her by showing her what another version of her pulled off. And all you did was prove that I'm amazing no matter what life I live. You also just gave me access to the entire history of a timeline I didn't know existed. <laughs> now I'm going to use that to beat you to the ground. Out in the city, though, Tim brings Kate back to her senses, telling her, I needed to bring you to the fold, but instead, you could have been the one to end it. Now you know why. Just then, Stephanie's voice comes in over the radios, telling him, Yeah, uh, that's not really what happened. Kate asks, Spoiler? And Stephanie tells her, Hey, spoiler stuff's in the name. Turns out Brother Eye and Ulysses have been playing with time from the start. Ulysses shouts to Brother Eye, Call back the Omax to the Belfry. Kill those idiots before they ruin everything. Stephanie turns back, telling Cassandra, Ah, uh, I'm gonna need a few minutes. And Cassandra tells her, Don't stop. I won't let them get you. She runs back to fight with Bruce, and Bruce tells her, I'm so sorry. I didn't want to bring you into this. I didn't want you to get hurt. And Cassandra says, Just saw another world. I'm not doomed to be bad. I am a bat. This is where I should be. Stephanie jacks back into the network, telling Tim and Kate that she's only got a few minutes, but after seeing what really happened, she could see what drove Tim insane. Kate did shoot Bruce, but Brother Eye only showed them what he wanted them to see. Tim's projection then changes to the time moments before Bruce's death with Kate telling him that it's bad out there. The government isn't going to ignore what he's doing anymore. Not after what happened with the League. But he can play cat and mouse around the world all he wants. Nobody's going to call her out for letting Batman slip through her fingers time and time again. Bruce looks at her and says that they don't have time for that. He's dying. The radioactive isotope that he was exposed to constructing the Brother Eye satellite. I'm paying the price. 
That's why I couldn't stand back anymore. That's why I wanted to set as much right before I put this whole dream to bed. Starting with Brother Eye. After he finishes his final protocol, he'll self-destruct, eliminating the files on the Bat computer and disable every vehicle and weapon that we have ever made as the Bat family. Kate asks, What are you saying? And Bruce tells her, Batman doesn't have to be eternal. Batman was an idea that I needed to live. All the people who have followed me on this dark path, they were all so good. So damn good. But Batman, Batman was an idea that holds them back. Hell, look at him. He's at Ivy University building his future. That's all I wanted for him. That's all I wanted for all of my children. Bruce then grabs Kate's gun, holding it to his chest in this future, telling her, I've already recorded a final message to the family on Brother Eye. That way they will all know that I saw this moment coming, that I chose for this. You will pass President Waller's psychic probing. She will see that you did kill me. Please. Plus, I'd be spared a few more minutes of extraordinary pain. Kate begins to cry, stating, I've always been honored to have been called family. Goodbye, Bruce. And that's when the gun went off. Tim begins to scream, no! And Stephanie says that the real Tim is starting to push back against the programming. Tim falls to his knees, stating that future Tim, he didn't know that this is what happened, did he? That's why he became evil. He thought she killed him. And Stephanie tells him, no. Brother I deleted the message that Bruce sent out. He wanted the war on crime that Batman promised him. And Ulysses shouts, and brother, I was right to want it. He just wanted to push Tim a little. Stephanie then asks, by what? Tearing the Bat family apart, rebuilding it? Everyone in the world is dead. And Tim was the one who killed most of them. That's why I'm giving Tim a free choice. He can choose to continue on this path and build the Gotham that his future self built, or he can choose this future and shut down Brother Eye. And Tim asks, why should she even trust him with that? And Stephanie tells him, because it doesn't matter if he's Robin, Red Robin, or Batman. It doesn't matter if she's spoiler, Robin, or Batgirl. She knows Tim Drake, and she believes in what he stands for. She knows that he'll make the right call. A few seconds go by, and the belfry begins to rumble, and Brother Eye calls out, Error! Error! Signal disturbance! Ulysses begins to shout, no, don't listen to her. We're so damn close. You can't let some idiot girl make you into some irrelevant nobody. Stephanie runs up, punching Ulysses, yelling, yeah, well, I just did. Outside, Kate asks Tim if it's really him, and he tells her, yeah, he's trying to keep the tower together to make sure everyone can get out. But even after trying to not become what his future self was, his dream was still weaponized and is something that could kill everyone and everything that he ever loved. Case as well. Her good news of the day is that she stays with the colony and still ends up killing Batman. And she doesn't want that in her life. Tim begins to rip away from his connection at Brother Eye. And as he lets go, he says that it was his dream. It turns so ugly. She hugs him and he asks, what comes next? Where do we go from here? Where can we go? Kate tells him that she doesn't know. She really doesn't know. But they'll figure it out like everyone else does. One day at a time. Soon the Belfry Tower fades into nothingness and three weeks go by. Bruce and Kate sit down for dinner, and Kate asks, It's never going to feel normal, is it? Bruce says that he heard that Jacob has been cleared out of his court-martial and reinstituted as colonel. Kate laughs, stating, You heard, huh? Bruce says, The president assured him the colony doesn't exist anymore. This is the cost of reinstatement. Kate then says that if it does get recreated, she had nothing to do with it. After everything that happened, it's time for her to stop listening to what others want her to do. Luke agreed that he's putting on the Batwing costume for a bit to focus on the Brother Eye tech to make sure that nothing like this happens again. Azrael needs more, and he spoke about seeing things from a greater perspective, and she heard that he had a long conversation with Cyborg. Bruce grabs his glass, stating, Do you plan on wearing the bat while you figure yourself out? And Kate asks, Are you going to try and stop me? Bruce tells her that she's the closest family that he has in the world right now. They may not see eye to eye, and that may frustrate him but he wants to be a part of her life as much as he wants her to be a part of his. Later, as Kate walks out of the restaurant, Jacob calls and asks how it went. Kate asks, you didn't listen in? And Jacob tells her, well, it's hard with just a laptop now. However, I got a ping on an old tip, something about a new coven of the religion of crime. Kate suits up telling him, good. Sounds like a job for Batwoman. Meanwhile, over at Leslie Tompkins' clinic, Leslie tells Cassandra that she's so happy that she'll be joining them. But Bruce wanted to be clear that she doesn't have to stay. Cassandra tells her, I want to be a better person, good at person things. Leslie laughs, opening the door to her room, telling her, well, I think we can help you with that. I also called on the help of an old friend to help tutor you until we can seriously sit down and talk about enrolling you into high school. The door opens up and Barbara finishes setting up her books, stating that she's so excited to be working with her. Cassandra shouts, Batgirl? And Barbara tells her, in here, Barbara's fine, or Babs. I understand you already have a good understanding of the written word, but trouble vocalizing. 
Figured we could start there and maybe work up to Shakespeare. Cassandra begins to quote Shakespeare's Tempest, and Barbara says, Wow, maybe we can skip ahead a few lessons. You really are amazing. Outside of her door, Clayface cries. And he says, Yeah, she really is. And he leaves a note in the door. As Clayface heads outside, he sits in the car. And Dr. Veronica asks, Does she see you? Clayface tells her, No, she's doing fine without me. I'm ready now. Let's get the hell out of this city before I change my mind. It's time to become something new. Elsewhere, Tim gets into a car and Stephanie asks, are you sure you want to do this? And Tim says, after all the things that she saw, he has so many things to ask. And now they have all the time in the world to figure out the answers. Stephanie pauses and tells him, they? Us? And Tim says that he's seen the lonely path and what it does to him. He's going to need someone to keep him honest. If she wants to come with them and see where the road takes them. Stephanie stops and telling him, yeah, I'd like that. Back over in Gotham, Alfred radios in stating that young Master Timothy's car has left Gotham heading south, the opposite direction of Ivy University. Bruce tells him to shut down the trace in the car. He'll reach out if he needs me. I trust him on that. Alfred then says that the whole project left a lasting impact, didn't it? Perhaps next you'll say that you're starting a school of young vigilantes. Bruce tells him, no, not yet. And Alfred shouts, yet? You can't be serious! Just then, the bat signal shines and Bruce tells Alfred, we're gonna shelf this conversation for now. Send a message to Jim. Tell him, everything's gonna be all right. And there you have it, you've made it to the end of a full story video. These are long, aren't they? Oh my god, but hey, it gives us a break because we just grab our old videos. I mean, Dan has to spend like, grand total of maybe like two hours splicing out some older footage, throws it all together into this one big epic video, and then he just, his computer like, kills itself for like 24 hours because it just renders this whole thing. He just comes here and he hangs out all day. And he won't go away. He said, Benny, if you buy pizza rolls, I'll never leave your house. And I thought he was joking, so I bought pizza rolls. We had a really cool night. We got to wear slumber, it was like a slumber party. We brought over like sleeping bags. I had my jammies on. They were diva jammies from Overwatch. He wore Lucio jammies. It was a cool night. We watched horror movies. He was eating pizza rolls, but then he didn't go home the next day. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what he was doing. Like I woke up and I was like, man, that was really fun, but got a wife, you gotta leave. Uh, we're not 10 and little girls. <laughs> and then I asked him why he bought me diva jammy jammies. I don't know. I don't know. I don't guys. I think I might have a problem with Dan. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what we should do about this. Let me know in your, in your uh, opinions down below, what we should do about Dan and his, uh, the fact that he won't leave and wants to eat pizza rolls and buys me pajamas. See you soon.